Okay, let's go ahead and begin the meeting. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez, can you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Yes. Ready? So I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can we get an acknowledgement of the certificate of posting, please? I'll so move. Okay, we have a first and a second. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Bet of 5 0. It's dead. All right. Okay. So, are we ready to proceed? Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to thank staff, department heads, and uh, financial officers um, for making it today. Sorry about this. Um, and uh, just wanted to, to recap, this is uh, our last um, special meeting that we're going to have this year. Um, and then we will have our regular uh, budget hearings on the 27th of June. So please mark your calendars, 9 a.m. here. And uh, today we're going to be uh, reviewing um, kind of some of the items that your board had raised before, some questions and some suggestions that uh, Gabriel put together. Uh, we're going to be looking at positions, FTEs, some of the requests that the department heads um, have submitted, as well as overall projects uh, for the CIP. So with that, um, Gabriel's put a PowerPoint presentation together. Um, maybe two hours, uh, we'll see. I know there's some appointments that need to, uh, some of you uh, need to go to, so um, we'll, we'll try to get it done uh, in that time. So, Gabriel? Yeah. Uh, good morning, board. Uh, as our CEO mentioned, uh, this is our second meeting uh, for the budget, and hopefully we can get some input from the board as to some of the different kind of projects that we're looking to put together, and we can continue to move this forward. and hopefully have something that we can have published by the 1st of June. So uh, let me get started here. So as our CEO mentioned, this is our second meeting uh, that we have. Um, quick overview, we're gonna be talking about positions, capital projects, uh, road infrastructure. Uh, we're gonna also be adopting our resolution for the gang limit. I'm gonna cover a little bit about it as well. Um, just a couple of quick dates. Uh, the recommended budget will be published on June 1st um, in our county website. And then subsequent to that, we're going to do our public hearings on June 27th. Um, we'll uh, be posting in the newspaper to make sure that it's adequately, adequately noted and posted uh, so the community is able to um, have input if they so choose as well. Um, a couple of big concerns uh, for our county and I guess more on nationwide and you know locally uh, demand for services in our county specifically have been increasing with um, growth in in our community and uh, new developments taking place that definitely has put more of a need for services whether that's um, uh, safety side with the, the sheriff's office or with uh, the RMA side looking at our public, public works folks making sure that our roads are maintained. So that's a big concern. Um, another concern is we have more or less minimal and stagnant revenues. We haven't really had too much growth on that side. We've been relying primarily on property tax increases, which have been, you know, great. Um, all across the state, property taxes, you know, have been increasing as long as well with property values. So um, those go hand in hand. So um, We've been primarily relying on that, and that's uh, one of the concerns that we have. Um, other revenues more or less been more or less stagnant for in terms of looking at uh, sales sales tax and transient occupancy tax and those kind of items. So um, I know with the board we've discussed looking at other kind of revenue streams, and we're actively with the Economic Development Corporation and within the county itself. We have our committees, and we're looking at areas where we can find some growth there. Um, other concerns are aging facilities and some deteriorating road infrastructure. Hopefully with some of the projects that we have in the, in the budget, we can address some of those concerns and, and see what we could do or put together a plan in place to, to move forward. Um, and then our kind of bigger concern is overall expenses are just growing faster than revenues. 
there's really no clear way for us to catch up to our expenses, especially even with the rate of inflation going up and just overall costs for everything increasing as well as even just our own staffing costs increasing as well. It's, it's like we're trying to pull, you know, penny pinch uh, everything out of, their, out of our revenues and we really don't have excess revenue to put towards everything. So that's one of the reasons we're coming to the board to see if we can get some guidance as to, you know, where should we focus our funding and our energy towards. Also knowing that, you know, there are many needs and we don't have the revenue to sustain everything. So that's a couple of the kind of bigger concerns I wanted to start off with. Um, so starting off, uh, as I mentioned, with position request, out of the general fund, uh, we uh, received essentially 23 new positions, uh, totaling a little bit over $2 million. This is a request out of the general fund. Um, throughout this process, I've been uh, communicating with department heads, talking about their positions that they've been requesting and trying to figure out some way where we can formulate uh, either if there's a way to get the position funded so through some other method, whether if it's a grant or subsidizing it with some other funding, uh, trying to minimize the impact that it'll have on the general fund, or if there's a way for there to be some sort of cost recovery. That's one thing that I've been you know, talking to the department head, seeing if it's something that we could look at and address. Um, for subvention funds, uh, essentially the two bigger asks are out of uh, HSA and behavioral health they're just asking for five positions combined. Um, subvention funds do have the funding in place to, to fund them. So from, from the CEO's office, we have no concern recommending to add those five positions. Um, as I mentioned, items to consider growth in uh, local revenue. I have highlighted 1920 to 2021 growth, close to $3 million. Uh, 2021 through 21-22, our growth is going to be estimated to be between one and two million and this is local revenue so i'm talking property taxes sales taxes tot um, this is money that's locally generated essentially we're not relying on the state or grants or the fed to fund any anything um, and and that's a really good key indicator of how our community is growing and what we're always looking for is making sure that we're able to sustain our own county with the revenues that we have on hand and if we start to see that um, essentially our local revenue isn't keeping up with our demand and we're relying more on outside help then that's where it becomes a little bit more of a tipping scale where if a funding stream were to go away on the state or the federal level then that leaves us out essentially um, outside freezing in the rain because then there's we'd have to figure out some way to fund whether it's a program or different positions from money that was secured in a different way, and now we'll have to figure out some form of way out of the general fund to, to subsidize it at, with, from local funding. Um, other items, like I mentioned, concerned with, um, through negotiations in the prior year and subsequently finishing up this year, uh, the 3% COLA from October and the 3% COLA that's gonna be taken into effect this year, each 3% COLA more or less amounts to about $800,000 in impact to the general fund um, each each year. So if we're looking at our growth and our uh, local revenues, we've been able to absorb that. Um, but at the end of the day, growth in the form of salaries and benefits is a compounding item where from one year to the next, as staff move up, there's promotions, there's more contributions that are made out of uh, the, the essentially the general fund towards uh, staffing, then those costs continue to increase little by little. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So those are big increases that we're taking into consideration. Uh, final little bit, essentially out of the positions, um, for recommendation out of essentially the county administration office, as I mentioned, looking at where we can leverage funding um, if the board so choose, um, we would advise at a maximum if the board wanted to increase 400,000 worth of positions, which amounts to maybe about four or five positions. That would be what we would say if we were to want to spend everything, taking into consideration, like I mentioned, our estimated growth in local revenue. But looking at it from a fiscal kind of 
stability standpoint and take into account essentially our local and our state and our you know national economy and different factors and and how we've been shaping out to be it really doesn't feel like that is a very good recommendation because as we've seen um, the cost of you know things have been going up with inflation um, people have been feeling a little bit unsteady about the local and the state and the national economy so right now this recommendation is more or less a wish um, what we would more or less hope to see or what we would recommend is that we wait off on adding positions um, essentially what we can do is do a mid-year revise to positions and then potentially look to see where we can um, if let's say six months down the line we start to see oh we didn't you know fall back into a recession it's everything looks like it's moving along then we can potentially look at adding positions then otherwise if we essentially you know jump in now and lock ourselves in into some situations where we're not um, able to clearly see what's going to happen in the future we may you know bite off more than we can choose so that's one thing to consider apart from that if there are positions which we can clearly identify funding for whether if it's through subvention funds or some sort of funding mechanism that allow for there to be some sort of cost recovery then those I think we'd be able to manage to move forward with but like I mentioned with some of the uncertainty it makes it a little bit difficult to see um, the next slide here I have essentially all the positions that were requested by all the general fund departments um, some of these positions we've been able to as I mentioned earlier talk talking with department heads and the different departments try to figure out some sort of funding mechanism to uh, try to get them on board some recommendations that I would bring forward to the board uh, for example out of the sheriff's office um, I know we've been moving forward with uh, some of the cannabis outdoor cultivation uh, changes through that ordinance and I would suggest that as we begin to see um, some of those revenues come in um, we haven't yet seen what that'll look like but as we begin to see some of that um, I know that we had through some prior meetings as we were amending the ordinance there was a lot of comments from the public about potentially leveraging that funding providing some of that to the sheriff because obviously it has to do with public safety and making sure that we're adequately policing this new industry um, so we were looking to potentially if those fundings that funding begins to materialize fund some of those positions um, out of some of these uh, continuing to go through the sheriff's office um, out of the correctional institution officers for the jail um, we added some this year um, through AB 109 and um, the general fund also added I believe in the last three years we've been adding a couple uh, and uh, I would suggest um, out of the correction officers as we've been seeing more or less um, the the now opening of the jail expansion and seeing how that flushes out um, I would suggest that within the sheriff's budget filling all the positions and as they uh, as new positions are needed because we filled everything there's no vacant positions then we can bring that back and like I mentioned coming back to the board as a mid-year ask um, going to then the assistant clerk of the board uh, this one is a hundred percent out of the general fund um, ask um, main reasoning is because of the workload associated with the uh, with, with that position and everything that it entails they help with uh, all the committees they help with clerking not just our board of supervisors meetings but um, some of the LAFCO meetings uh, Parks and Rec um, so th there's a lot of different items that uh, are taken into consideration and that's something that we propose um, for the assessor's office I had a discussion with Tom we're going to be doing a change uh, a flip-flop from that position to another position um, so uh, we're actively looking to see how we can accommodate some of the requests from the different departments um, I the clerk recorder elections office we had two positions that were requested um, I believe the main uh, reason for some of these uh, positions is due to the state wanting to make sure that we're actively engaging more with the population 
Um, there was some funding that the um, that the the state had set aside uh, uh, to cover essentially for uh, counties to be doing more outreach. Um, and I think this is a key driver into wanting to have some of these positions filled. Um, out of the clerk recorded election, they have been pretty well staffed, um, as in they either have maybe one or no vacancies throughout. So they're, um, in terms of making sure that they're utilizing all their staff, they're doing a really good job. Um, library, um, they're wanting to add positions. Um, related to grants. Uh, one reason that I would be a little bit hesitant on some of the, on, on the library positions is that they are tied with grants and the library has added um, a decent amount of positions with grants and some of those grants have end dates. And if they are limited term staff added through grants, if the grants aren't renewed in the future, then that's where, you know, the people could be out of position. So I would be hesitant on those. Uh, the probation department is asking for a juvenile institution officer and an information tech analyst. The information tech analyst, uh, our chief probation officer, Joe Fronta, is going to be bringing that position to the CCP uh, committee to see if we can get it funded through AB 109. So looking at that mechanism in place. Juvenile institution officer position um, through changes out of the state where uh, there are changes to the juvenile justice realignment uh, program shifting that responsibility back to the counties there has been a change associated with the county having to do more uh, to manage the, the, these kids here locally um, and I know that there have been a couple of contracts that have come to the board in relation to uh, the way that we're going to be running this program um, and the state's actually going to be sending us some funding but it's gonna be more to cover wraparound services related to this program. What we're gonna to wanna to do is minimize the, um, our kids essentially leaving the county. We're gonna to try to make sure that we can hold on to our kids because them being close to home and being here essentially if their family lives here and they're able to have the support around it along with the services we provide that may be uh, what we're looking to do. In. For the juvenile institution officer, there are some minimum requirements at the juvenile hall, and that's what we're looking and asking for. Capital projects, as uh, the board has seen, we have a variety of different projects, and in this presentation, we'll cover uh, a lot of those. Um, and for this position, there is some cost recovery out of the projects that are being uh, put together. So for example, if there is an HHSA or behavioral health project that is being taken um, into consideration the time associated with the capital projects manager that they spend with that project gets billed out uh, to the respective departments so there's cost recovery there um, the staff analyst out of the regional agency that's a shared cost between the county and the two cities uh, through that uh, uh, the regional agency so that's why it's only 38,000 that would be the only impact out of the general fund um, the two following positions, there are CSA positions. So the way that we're looking to approach these is through essentially a 218 vote process. The CSAs would vote uh, essentially to fund these positions and to um, essentially what this will enable is to have more staff to be able to manage essentially the CSAs and provide the adequate services. But again, the CSAs would enact a vote to make sure that they would have enough funding in place to to be self-sufficient. So, um, could be you know startup costs out of the general fund if we decide to move forward with it now, or if we wait until the 218 process, that'll be after. And then the two last positions out of the planning, uh, planning uh, with a lot of the growth that's been happening in our county, and um, out of the planning side, there is a lot of cost recovery out of. All the permits that we issue, all the plans that are reviewed and everything, uh, that's one of the items that in the past we've only had essentially um, our planners that uh, essentially have to multitask and do a lot of various different, um, wear a lot of various different hats. Um, and what the planning technician is going to allow is for essentially planners to be able to focus a lot more on their actual work with different developments and different uh, you know, reviews that they have to do. The planning tech can do a lot of the lower level items. So um, that's one of the positions that's being asked. Code enforcement, um, I know in, in the past we've had essentially a contract through Four Leaf that has been able to handle a lot of our code, code enforcement issues when we've been 
short staff. Um, what we're potentially hoping to do with this position is if we're able to fill it, then that would reduce essentially our contract with code enforcement, so there could be some sort of trade off there. Um, all in all, like I mentioned, it's about $2 million ask um, out of the general fund. Um, from uh, prior kind of discussion, the prior slide, from the general fund, what we would say is if the board so choose to move forward with adding positions, the maximum that we would feel or I would say would be, um, I guess, comfortable with would be about 400,000, would amount to maybe four or five positions. But uh, considering the current state of you know uncertainty in both our local and national economy, we would say that um, we forego adding positions um, unless they are specifically funded through some sort of funding mechanism. Um, and then potentially looking back, let's say half, halfway through the year and seeing how we're progressing and if uh, it's looking like um, uh, we're you know, out of the woods and it's looking better, then we can look at potentially adding, but at the same time reviewing the funds as they're coming in during that time and seeing if it's something that we can handle. Um, if not, then uh, we continue you know, status quo and we look back and we say, hey, we, we made a good decision by not you know, jumping in without knowing what was gonna be ahead of us. So uh, that's more or less the recommendation uh, out of those positions. Um, so as I mentioned, that's, that's something that I've been working with with the different departments. Um, and uh, I think I'll move forward to the cemented positions request. Um, Excuse me, Gabe, can I yes. quick question? Sure. Um, you kind of touched on this before, but or just a moment ago, but a couple of the, or maybe more than a couple, mm -hmm. but I, when I look at like capital program manager or code enforcement, as you just mentioned, mm -hmm. um, you know, we off as a board, we over the last year, you know, we approve, um, you know, X amount for a contract where we're going outside um, because we don't have the staff to do it in house. Right. And, you know, we raised the question, you know, why are we doing so much out, you know, outside? Um, I gather that the departments like RMA has looked at that trade off because, you know, often when you go outside, you pay more, of course. Right. Right. Um, of course, you're not paying benefits, so there's that there's that trade off. But have they closely looked at, um, you know, like I see a capital pro program manager. If we don't have to go outside, is there a clear trade off there? Do we know that code enforcement? Obviously, if you don't, if you only have one code, not only if you're going outside, mm -hmm. uh, but if you only have one code enforcement officer, which is my understanding, kind of right now, mm -hmm. you're not collecting, you're not enforcing, you're probably not collecting. Right. So I'm just curious how much of that has been done in so, looking at it. So if I may, I'd like to go ahead and comment on a few things and then I'll defer it back to Gabriel. So like with regards to the code enforcement officer, there are actually two positions that we have. One is vacant. There are interviews this Thursday and there's been obviously rollover. Um, and there has been, you know, um, staffing uh, transition in, that, in one of the positions. Hence the, the amount of work that we have, the need to bring somebody on to do the work, contractors. And that's to really fill the gap. But we're, we're in the process of, of actually interviewing, trying to fill that position. There are other positions in here. Uh, I know the uh, sheriff's deputies, I believe corrections, where there are vacancies and the, trying to fill those positions as well, um, along with some of these other positions. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but we are, um, it really has been to subsidize the work, because we're one deep in many areas. So when you're one deep and you lose somebody, we can't just, we don't have the budget to, to you know, um, to hire somebody. We, we have a process we have to go through from an HR perspective. Um, and so... Uh, that's when we need to get the help. So that's when we hire contractors um, to, to kind of help us and subsidize that role. So, Madam um, Chair, I had a question. Yes. You mentioned, Ray, COVID yep. enforcement officer? Code enforcement. C code enforcement. Yeah, I heard COVID Co too. COVID. <clears throat> COVID, yeah. COVID-19, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> code Let's enforcement. Start the <laughs> yeah. Um, just to, he's coming yeah, after point of clarification. <laughs> I have a radar, sorry. Um, so, no, I mean, 
from what you're saying, Ray, is, is your backfilling right now or what the request is is going to backfill? Because I heard, correct me if I'm wrong, Gabriel, four positions you want to support basically with that $400,000. Well, let me, let me give you a rundown. So basically, if you look at the CS, uh, CSA coordinator manager and you look at the one, this will go from the bottom up, staff service specialist. When you look at that as a 218 vote, that's not going to, when you look at the very bottom there, it says general fund. So you're thinking it's going to come from the general fund. Well, it does go into a, into the general fund, how it's actually managed. But the fund's going to come through a t 218. The CSAs are going to pay for it. Yeah. Right. They're the ones that are going to have to pay for those two positions. Pending the vote. Pending the vote and pending their approval. Right. So that's those are potentially um, that. When you look at um, the shared cost, $38,000, um, there is a need for that. And it's not a lot of money out of the 2.1 million. 38,000 is something that we could afford with that because it is a joint effort um, on the staff analyst. Um, as well as the probation office um, using AB 109 funding through the CCP, that's another tool or another mechanism that we've been using for many positions uh, in years past to, to be able to staff up our corrections office and safety folks. So. Um, so that's just an example there um, of, of those positions. So what we're looking at and what Gabriel was highlighting was that there's some positions, there's a handful of positions that we would consider. Um, and that would looks like the office assistant in the sheriff's office, the assistant clerk of the board, um, the capital program manager, and the planning technician. Those are the positions that we would probably, there could be a need for um, out of that 400,000. But what Gabriel's saying is there's an uncertainty right now. Yeah. With, you know, um, you know, interest rates. There's a lot of things happening. And um, so, you know, we're, we're thinking let's just hold off, let's keep it status quo, but come back to your board mid year. If things are fine and things are tracking, then we can come back. Unless your board so chooses to go a different direction. I had if your board question. wants to go in another direction, we would say 400 max. That's what we're saying. Yeah. And it's up to your board. It's up to your board. Well, because so from what I'm hearing is hold off because some of these are going to be covered, like basically covered by whether it's AB 109 funds. Yeah. You know, um, the, the cannabis through the sheriff's department might help support some of right. these positions. So <clears throat> my only question is, is like with the elections coordinator, that's I mean, we're, we're, we have a primary that's three weeks away. I would. I, I would like to hear from the elections department if they can clarify the need for for that. Is that a, a need that's going to be necessary now um, to help through the election cycle and into and, the general? And that's exactly why we invited all the department heads here to have open dialogue. To, to if you had any questions and to, to go over that. So yeah. So can can you we'll explain? In, we'll invite Joe Paul Gonzalez or Francisco, or Francisco up. On, the, on this particular item, I'm going to defer to Francisco Diaz, Assistant County Clerk uh, Recorder. Uh, thank you for the question. So just to give you some context, the reason we're coming forward asking for the elections coordinator position is in 2007, the department as a whole, clerk, recorder, and elections had 11 people on staff. 2013, we went down to three people. Now we're up to 10. So we're still pre-2007 levels in staffing. In that 15-year span, about 67%, we, have, we had an increase in 67% overall in voter registration, and we had over 300 operational impacting mandates that are put on our office. And as of right now, we have two full-time dedicated people to elections. Uh, we're fortunate to have two people, and we're also fortunate to have about more temporary staffing. However, 40% of our entire staffing, that's for all three departments, it's temporary non-benefit employees. And out of those people, they only work about six months because they're limited due to their time that they have, and only about 10% of them return the next year. So we spend about 30% of clerk, recorder, and elections time training new people. And this, of course, is one of the reasons why we have such a high turnover in our office. And it's clearly, you can see that by the amount of years of experience that we have in the department. So right now we have the, we average about 4.4 years in government experience in the department. And that's including my well-seasoned nine years of government experience. So I'm the outlier, I'm the 0.4%. And 
And one of the main reasons the selection coordinators, we are requesting it is to be able to help us with all this new growth and outreach, but also a lot of the new mandates. So it's, it's not feasible anymore to be able to bring someone and train them for two months and expect to do all these complicated things. You need someone that's there throughout the years to be able to learn and be able to be well-versed on election code policies to be able to administer an election. We use one of the terms that elections used to be a catering business. It's a full-fledged restaurant now. And when you have two people, there's really no secession planning. We, we are the secession planning. Mm. So we are the ones that are stepping in. That's why a lot of the times when you have phone calls or you come to the office, you actually find myself or Joe Paul helping you out in front of the counter because once again, we only have two full-time dedicated people. Francisco, so there's, is there any funding that would come from the state? Because I know this, is, this was just new, like with that Voter Choice or Voter, voter Choice Act, or what was it, Vo Voter, sorry, that's the new bill that, yeah, that has to do with outreach. So correct, the Voter's Choice Act. So we were fortunate to be able to apply and receive $30,000. That covers a lot of our outreach efforts. So it does cover some of our time, it covers some of the costs, whether if you see uh, ads and advertisements on the, on the bus stops or a billboard, it is covering that cost. There is expected more funding to come in our office. However, once again, we're limited of how much we can use those funds if we don't have the staff. Mm -hmm. if, you know, if we're able to release people to go out in the community to do the outreach voter registration, then, then we can get the reimbursement. But if we don't have the people to send out, then we're not gonna be able to utilize that reimbursement. So this position would help with cost recovery? Correct. Thank you. The only thing I would add uh, is that there is a bill uh, right now, AB uh, 2576, which is intended, well, actually at the last board meeting, the board um, approved a letter of support for that legislation. And uh, that bill specifically provides $15 million to the Secretary of State to provide funding to counties um, for the purpose of outreach, uh, specifically for um, the high school uh, outreach. But San Manuel County is one of the listed counties uh, to that would uh, be provided, one of the seven counties to be provided, uh, uh, you know, funding. The other point that I wanted to bring up is that. One of, the, one of the biggest reasons why people leave uh, the county, which is a retention you know, problem that we have, is workload. Yes. And um, this is why the, these two uh, positions were brought forward as a request in the budget for your consideration. Thank you, Joe Paul. What, what bill was that up so I could remember? It's AB 2576. And it requires what? That, what is the, the intent uh, of the bill? What it would uh, move from the state controller's office the authority to, spending authority. Oh, that's right. To the uh, Secretary of State, and it was $15 million of appropriation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Joe Paul. Thank you, Francisco. So. So I have a question for you then. So in terms of, actually, sorry for the, all the departments. So we're looking at 2.1 million requests, but you only want us to spend 400,000. I was gonna say, uh, as, uh, Go ahead, Gabriel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, and so I, we have all the other departments here and a full list, a whole grid of ask. And so if we're gonna ask the elections department I would like to hear from the other because this is going to be a very tough decision for us to make and I don't know I don't want to make the decision just on the basis of numbers on the page um, and um, if I had my way I'd, I'd give it all to law enforcement mm -hmm. um, because we need it we're we're woefully understaffed there um, so do we have time to hear from the departments um, because and I know I know we have a short period of time, but this is a very crucial yeah. vote that we're going to be making, and it's going to impact all these departments. And I see the departments here. They gave us our time, and I would love to hear from them if it's permissible. Yeah, no, this is, this is what this meeting is about today. Just, just to highlight, though, to just be clear with the board, is that there are some – maybe I can invite up – I'm going to – invite up Hanny Ring. Yes. Um, just from an HR perspective, sorry to put you on the spot, um, to kind of highlight some of the vacancies and kind of some of the issues we're having. Uh, Joe Paul Gonzalez, our auditor controller, highlighted um, something I think is very important. We are having difficult times. It's not just us, it's everywhere. And we're doing a lot. 
all of our staff are doing a heck of a job, but they're, they're having to, to do a lot of work. And it does weigh on you eventually. It is. It, it, but, I, but I did want to ask, Hanny, a couple of the issues that were seen in some of these positions is that there, there are there's still vacancies. They're asking for positions, but there's vacancies. So what will ultimately happen is if your board puts money to some of these positions that we have vacancies, we're just going to have more vacancies, and we're not going to be able to put the money where maybe somewhere else where we could put it at. And I think that's important for your decision-making, very important. Say, say that again, Ray. What I'm saying is that there are vacancies in some of these positions. They have not filled, they, have, they don't have all their deputies or correction officers or code enforcement or staffing to the levels where they are already approved in the budget. So these, so these now you're, requests are over and above those vacancies. That's right. And that's so, what I wanted Henny to kind of highlight where some of these vacancies are at so that way you can make a better decision. We've, I think already, that's we've already approved other positions that have not been filled. They've not been filled, and that's important and in that the And that are part of that factored into the budget. That's correct. So even if, if we didn't approve one position, there are still positions that are going to get filled. Yeah, so I would say with some of these, okay, let's get them fully staffed, and then let's come back mid-year or come back next year uh, when they're fully staffed if there's a need. Just Because we could redirect those funds to – somewhere else you know i mean if you noticed right here do you notice one thing that your board has been asking for for a while that's not here road crew road crew workers you know why it's not there because they have they don't have all the jobs filled so they're going to get the jobs filled first and then we'll come back and ask for more um, so I would just request then, I mean, maybe, Henny, you're going to talk about Jenny, it. Jenny, that's what I was going to have. Yeah, yeah um, but then each of the departments as you come up, if you could let us know, just to corroborate, make sure that, you know, you, it's accurate, too. I'm sure it is accurate, Henny, but um, just to re, you know, re-verify um, what positions you do have open and, um, you know, I want to know we, that information. We, we put them on three minutes, you think? No, put them on a minute. Just a minute. <laughs> it was 60 seconds, right? Yeah. And <laughs> Speed dating. Quick. <laughs> Go ahead, um, Annie. Good morning, Madam Chair. Um, Thank Annie you. Ring with Human Resources. Um, what I'll do is I'll kind of just go through what we have going on right now. Um, continuous recruitments, which means they are continuously rolling in. People apply. Um, we review the applications, and we refer those names off to the departments. Current uh, continuous recruitments right now is the deputy sheriff position, correctional officer position, and then road maintenance worker. So those are always kind of rolling in. We're looking at them weekly to see if we've had any new, new applications in. We refer those off. Um, current vacancy rate right now, what Human Resources has pulled together yesterday for the deputy sheriff recruitment uh, uh, position, we have five vacancies for correction officer uh, we have currently three vacancy, vacancies. For road maintenance worker, we have currently three vacancies. And code enforcement was another one we were asked to look at. Currently one vacancy, but we're in a very active process. I believe there are two people that recently interviewed that Ray just spoke of. Um, so that hopefully will be remedied very shortly. Um, if we look at the referrals that come through, you know, the names come in, like I said, for deputy sheriff, We've had like 14 names referred off, but out of that, only four people may be hired. Uh, again, you have an extensive background process with law enforcement. We obviously have to, the department has to be very selective of who they choose. Um, we also have to be, we're also, it's very competitive. We're bumped up against very large counties that may pay a little bit more. So we are, you know, we're all kind of trying to um, find people in the same pool as other counties as well. So there's other issues that kind of play in part with that. Um, road maintenance worker, if I wanted to go over that one just a bit. Um, that one we started doing backgrounds <coughs> last June, I got, last summer I believe. Um, and that also has kind of added to the complication of getting more applicants in that pass and that we're able to so that are hireable. So, so that's another issue that has come now in, into play a little bit. So that kind of uh, slows that process a bit. Um, some of those things are just part of what we're, we're con like I said, continuous. We're, we're continuously looking for those applications, referring them off as soon as we get them. 
um, I'm available for any questions if you have any other. Yeah, and just with regards to the road crew workers, we didn't actually um, uh, increase salary as well, if you recall, but we're still kind of in the same situation where we're, yeah. <laughs> oh, one quick question, Madam Chair. Do we had a 20% vacancy rate not that long ago. Do we yeah. have that actual number? Um, Gabriel, did you run the numbers on that? I was going to say it's going to be at the next board meeting, okay. <laughs> third, third quarter report. Um, I was going to say, I could, if I go off the top of my head, countywide it's still about 20%. I mean, we're not escaping that. General fund. I think it's lower than, it's yeah, definitely lower than the subvention yeah, funds. Subvention about, funds about are higher. About 15%, I would say. I'd have to look at the report, but it's going to be at the next board meeting mm -hmm. next week. Um, but it's running around there. Um, and one thing that like Ray mentioned, it, the majority of vacancies are more on the cemented funds. I mean, they have the funding for the positions. General fund is typically more staffed uh, for the majority of the time, besides some of the positions that are just take a little bit longer, whether it's the deputies or the correction officers. There's a more extensive recruiting process involved. So um, it, whether that has something to do with it or the competitive nature of the positions across the neighboring counties, then we do have that, and then loss of uh, some of those positions to our neighboring counties is also something that's factored in. Hence, when you look at the yeah. next slide or the few slides um, after, you're going to see the number is much smaller. I think it's like 400,000 versus 2 million, 2.1 million. So obviously, there's a, a larger vacancy. So they got to fill those positions before they ask for more. So it's it's kind of um, with regards to the subvention office. So. So with that, it, I think your board did, did ask to invite some department heads up. Why don't we start off with the sheriff, if that's okay, okay. with your board? And, and as they do come up, can you please let us know the vacancies that you have so that we can take that into consideration as we look at your ask? Um, it, it's, we're in a difficult position in terms of making this decision, and um, I don't want to do anyone a disservice. Uh, I'm confident you're going to approve all my positions, Madam Chair. Thank you for having me speak <laughs> If today. I had all the votes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, Madam Chair and members of the board, thank you for having me here today as your sheriff. And um, so I do, I do want to, I'm, I'm capturing the theme here, but so I'll kind of speak to it as far as the sheriff. Um, and I love everybody in this room, but I'm probably going to upset some people. So in order for us to have a thriving and safe community, you have to have public safety. You have to. Everything else makes your community nicer but community uh, needs public safety. So when you call the police or you call for, because your house is on fire, someone has to respond. There's no other option. We have not made it back even close to where we were in 2010 as a sheriff's office. Uh, the numbers that I've been told over and over again, and I haven't really researched this, but we went from 96 total employees in the sheriff's office to 48 in 2011. We're back to 62. So we have made progress, but since I've been here in 2014, the constant theme is you're not able to get up to the allotted positions, therefore we're not gonna add more. And what we talked about a little bit earlier, or what was spoken about is the competitive nature of hiring in law enforcement today. Nobody wants to be a cop. We're so fortunate in this community to have the support of this community. We don't have the rhetoric going on here that's going on in other parts of our nation, so we're very fortunate for that. This board has been really good to our office and to the community in general. I mean, just the staffing study that was done to bring us up to 90% and the fact that this, that the CEO's office and our board included counties like Santa Clara was almost unheard of for us to go up against the big guns like that. So we actually in our office are not seeing a huge turnover, which some of that rhetoric has been out there during this campaign. We've lost two deputy sheriffs in two years. One of them was for as a young family that instantly got an $18,000 pay raise by going to Gilroy. Um, Gilroy's an attractive place for people from here. And then the other one, his wife was offered a job as a nurse in Southern California, so they had to relocate because it was a little bit too far to commute from San Bernardino to San Benito. So I think we're doing well, um, of course, they're working for the best sheriff in the state of California, so that, that <laughs> she has something to do with it. Um, but it's an extremely, extremely competitive. I just met with the Attorney General uh, last week and uh, some of our partners up in the Bay Area. For context, San Francisco Police Department has 800 vacancies right now. They did a test 
a written test the morning that I met with uh, AG Bonta. The assistant chief of San Francisco was there. They had just administered a written test that morning. Eight people took the test. That's from a time where we used to have four positions available and a thousand people would compete for that. Mm -hmm. So the issue that I have is that if we keep, well, it's almost a mixed message because I know it's frustrating to have me come and say, hey, we have some candidates, I need to add a position, but it's like February, right? And it's, it doesn't fit into the grand scheme of being able to project out the budget. But in this competitive nature, we have to snatch up the best candidates we can when we get them. So I have a, a few notes here. Um, I can't recruit without the positions, right? And I know we have open positions right now. I think, personally, I think we have four in operations and possibly four in, in, in our corrections division. Um, that's what I believe we have. But um, the problem is, is that, so if we have, let's just talk about operations real quick. So if I have four open positions and I do a process and let's say I get eight qualified candidates. So I pick the best four but all eight would be great. So I pick four and I put them onto the background process, which costs money. And then three of them drop out of the background because we find something. The other four that I really, really liked that would have been awesome here, they don't, they're not available anymore because another agency already snatched them up. It's a race. It's a race, we're butting heads with our partner agencies and we're fighting over the same people. And it's a race to get these people in the door. And so, one of the things that's happening is, so San Francisco's down 800, Oakland's down, I think, 500, and San Jose's down 200. Those are all agencies that pay pretty well and have a lot of resources and a lot of upward mobility, and they cannot even staff. Um, the other issue is that by lowering standards, which I refuse to do, I refuse to lower the standard for, and I, this is what we went through when I asked you for captains. I got no qualified candidates. One of the options was to lower the standard for captain, and I will not do that. So that's when we understaffed and revitalized the uh, revamped the lieutenant position because I did have people qualified for that <coughs> position. So when we lower the standard, we see what's happening in San Jose right now. If you look at San Jose Police Department, it's a storied police department with a fantastic reputation. They cannot get candidates, so they've lowered their standard. They just had an officer die of a fentanyl overdose at a police party. They had another guy doing unmentionable things on a search warrant, and he was taken into custody. And they have about 10 cases going right now of misconduct in their police department from new employees that they've just brought in because, in my opinion, the standard's getting lower. I've been creative in underfilling positions um, to be able to, to really align with our strategic plan in the focus areas of operational development and excellence in uh, healthy and safe communities. Um, being short in an office where we have to respond to calls for service is just not, it's not, it's not an option to not have staff. We, again, we went from 96 employees to 48. We're now at 62. Some of us have been out on the campaign trail, and it's a recurring question from the community. It's the frustration with police staffing or sheriff staffing and sheriff's response. So real quick, I have four vacancies right now in operations. We have two shifts, six to six, and then six to six with no overlap. I'm lucky if I have a sergeant and two people per shift for 1,400 square miles. Without having a swing shift to overlap, the honest answer is from about four in the afternoon till maybe seven in the evening, there's not a lot of coverage on the street because the shift's coming in to write their reports and the other shift's gearing up to go out on the street. That same thing repeats itself from about four, five in the morning till seven in the morning where we have theft, so we have no coverage and overlap. One of the things that I need to bring back to this community is a swing shift so that we have an overlap of coverage so that there's always deputy sheriffs on the street and we never have a time, these gaps in time where we don't have coverage. But doing that, just to bring a swing shift to this community is gonna take two sergeants and six deputy sheriffs. That's a huge ask in one budget, and I didn't ask for that, I asked for half of that. Other needs that we have, it's a frustration, and I know that Supervisor Tiffany has heard this, we don't have South County coverage right now. So that's gonna take two deputy sheriffs for just 50% coverage down there. Seven day a week coverage, half the day is gonna take two more deputy sheriffs. San Juan Batista is looking to add another deputy, which that would be funded by their city. I need another detective because I only have one. We're losing our task force, so I need three deputy sheriffs for a task force. 
We've already talked about the administrative assistant. That's 16 positions that I need in operations. I'm trying to chip away with that at five on this budget cycle. In the jail, we added four from the Community Corrections Partnership, thanks to my cooperation and in partnership with Chief Frontella. We need four more. Our jail has expanded quite a bit. It's expanded from, I wanna get the numbers correct here. Sorry, I'm missing, uh, I'm missing my numbers here, but it went from about 142 to over 200 beds in two facilities and programming has been brought back because we were lacking programming for a number of years. So the whole, in essence, what I'm asking for is, oh, if I got everything that I just discussed, all the positions that I talked about that we need just to be a functional sheriff's office, that would take me up to 84 positions, which is still 12 short of the pre-2010 cuts. And I'm not saying that we're gonna get back there. They may have been overstaffed back then. I haven't really done that analysis, but even, even if you gave me everything, if you gave me 21 positions in this budget, I would still be short 12 of where we used to be. However, there is a, there, there is a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. I am gonna be applying for Prop 64 funding um, real quick. Prop 64 funding is the marijuana funding because our county allows indoor, outdoor, and retail, we qualify for that. Not that many counties qualify for that funding. Um, in April of 2021, the Board of, uh, the Board of Community Corrections um, awarded 23 jurisdictions, a total of $21 million. They, each jurisdiction got almost, some got over a million, some, some got a million. I know a friend of mine, Sheriff Billy Hansall up in Humboldt County got 12 deputy sheriff positions out of that funding from the state. And there's a surplus of money there that we qualify for and I will be asking for. <clears throat> I don't know if it's reasonable to approve positions, unfund, but unfund them so I can recruit for them and we can come back and ask this board for permission to fund them. Because my, my concern is that I'm gonna have these four positions open and I'm gonna do a recruitment and I'm gonna get 10 plus good qualified applicants. And I'm gonna have to pass on the other four because I don't have those positions available to me and they're gonna end up working in another community and we're gonna keep playing catch up. So I know, I'm sorry, I spoke way longer than I expected to, but that's kind of where I'm coming from as the, as the sheriff to be able to adequately staff my office. Questions? Thank you, Sheriff. That was 10 minutes, so yeah. sorry. That was good. Um, I'm just kind of a little sorry. I'm just kind of a little concerned. We're kind of off track, and we haven't gone to the to the public <laughs> yet. Um, and I know that there are a few different presentations in this one slide, yeah. but but it's we're still presenting, or the county is still presenting. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Supervisor Tiffany. Just we'll stay just, off track. Yeah, just to be clear, uh, and I know there's a huge need out there, but to just um, to cover the swing shift that you talked about, um, as well as to do a better job. Um, in South County, which you mentioned, how many um, positions over and above what you currently have open? I mean, if, if you were to get what you're requesting here, which is three deputies, and you have a request for a sergeant, um, does that get you there if the other positions that are open were filled or you're still gonna be short? I'm just curious. Yeah, we'll still be short. So that's half of a swing shift. So I could either do a midweek swing shift or I could get those four positions, dedicate two to South County, dedicate a sergeant to have kind of a pseudo task force in the meantime, um, or just oversee San Juan Batista. We can use that, those positions in the interim. I, there's, a, there's a potential, you can give me all four of these positions like our CAO is talking about. I may not even be able to fill them in this, in this fiscal year. But the, the, the concern that I have is if we keep waiting and waiting and waiting to add positions, because we wouldn't, I guess if, if we would have been adding positions a little bit at a time throughout all these years, we would be closer to our goal today than we are. But it's because it's hard to get to that level where you're full, and then when you're full, how do you recruit? So then you come back and ask the board, but you wanna wait till mid-year, you wanna wait till the next budget year, and it pushes the process off, and now I'm losing candidates that I could be hiring here to other jurisdictions because there's a huge vacuum in the Bay Area right now, and nobody wants to be a cop. When when are you going to know about the Prop 64 funding? And 
So yeah. that cohort just ended, and so the next one, the, the application process, I believe, is now. Um, but it will, it'll be soon. It, it should align with the with the fiscal year. And the the cannabis task force that you mentioned to me is a separate issue as well, where we can get assistance for cannabis Correct. specifically from yes. from Fresno County or wherever it, it, it's located. Yes. Okay. We still have that resource available to us. That'll be about twelve to fourteen. Um, deputy sheriffs, police officers that would not would not impact our general fund because it'd be given to us through the state. Okay, thank you. Just clarification: is that one position or two positions or ten for for the one? cannabis task force? So the, it's already through the Department of Cannabis Control stood up a regional task force out of Fresno that will mm -hmm. cover our area. So it would come at uh, it would come at zero. Okay. Uh, contribution from us. Okay. But as far as respond, that's a, that's, a, that's a thing that is a concern. It's not about policing the legal people that are doing it correctly. Illegal. It's about still going after the illicit cartel marijuana that's in our community. I would be able to utilize this task force instead of our own staff. Madam Chair, if I may just add one comment too. Um, so it's a difficult task for administration and the board obviously because there's great need everywhere and obviously safety is an important um, element to that one of the initiatives that the board gave direction to administration is to go a different direction on how we do budget to remove away from vacancy budgeting hence exactly what <laughs> sheriff taylor is talking about was a benefit for him we're going away from that because he could we could fund those positions we could and then if he doesn't, you know, get those people hired, we can divert that money somewhere else within the vacancy budgeting. But now we have to be concise this year. We are plowing the way to having a budget without vacancy budgeting. So it makes it much more difficult, hence the reason why we're concerned about the 400000 mm -hmm. <laughs> So it's we want to see how this year plays out and how the budget um, pans out. Um, but to, you know, there's a lot of need, and the sheriff has emphasized the great need in his office, and I think the need is in every other office. I think there's uh, every office is just you know working really hard with not as much, um, not as many resources and staffing. So, anyways, I just wanted to highlight that for the board. I think you you know that, but um, just to put it on record too. Yeah, and I think too, just for me for the board to understand, we're reasonable. I don't expect it, um, you to us to bleed out because the sheriff is saying he needs more more people we when we met with gabe early on he said put it all out on the table so we know where we are so all we're trying to do is support our staff put it out on the table say that we're going to need like 21 positions come you know as soon as possible that's not reasonable so if we can chip away a little bit or if we have to come back in mid-year you know that we're going to be team players we're, we're not you know no feelings are going to be hurt but i'm doing a disservice to the deputy sheriffs and our correctional officers if i'm not asking Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Um, maybe we can ask a few more departments. Maybe Tom or um, Melinda, if you want to come up. Uh, morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, in the assessor's office, um, we were asking for one position, the accounting appraiser tech position. And... Um, as Gabe had mentioned, and as you all know, property tax is your biggest source of revenue um, in the county. Uh, when I saw the recommendation from 2.1 million to 400,000, I decided, hey, we have one position that's vacant right now, an assessment clerk position. And I sent uh, mm -hmm. an email to Gabe, maybe we can just swap that out. So the additional cost in that would be probably under 20,000, yeah. I imagine, yeah. to do that. So. Okay. In our office, you know, there's just a lot of stuff going on. If you look around the whole county, I mean, there's this new subdivision starting. You got San Juan Oaks, 1,100 homes going there. In Ridgemark, on the lump of property, there's probably net over 90 homes there. Oak Creek, they're starting that subdivision. I believe there's over 100 homes there. Uh, we have Santana Ranch, which is about 40 to 50% built out. So there's another 550 homes there. Uh, Ward Homes um, area there, there's probably another, uh, they've started that one, I imagine, another 
maybe 300 homes there. So there, there's, there's just homes popping up all over the place. And we also have the passage of Prop 19. And what that does, it uh, creates a, quite a bit more work for us. Um, it allows counties uh, that people live in other counties to transfer their property tax base. And they're, they're coming to our county because, yeah, you know, from Santa Clara County, where, for instance, they sell their house in Willow Glen for over $2 million. They have a, a tax base of, uh, let's say, 150000 They come to Hollister here in, in the county, and, and they buy a property for $1.5 million. So that property, you know, typically would be assessed at $1.5 million. Of course, they bring their property tax base of 150000 so it's basically 10% of, of the assessed value. So we're losing from that end of it. Uh, the other part of Prop 19, uh, there's the parent-to-child exclusion before where you could pass on your property to your kids. That's been somewhat limited now, so it only applies to the, the parent's home that you could transfer to your kids. So all the other type of properties, the commercial, industrial properties, residential properties, we need to reappraise. So that kind of offsets some of the loss from the uh, people transferring their tax base to the county. But the, there's a caveat to there in the fact that we have to now monitor these properties. So we have to verify that the parents lived in the property, the kids are living in the property. If that property turns into a rental property down the road, well, then we have to bring that property up to the original assessed value. So it, there's a lot of moving parts to Prop 19. So. We, we wanted a, to get a, a more of a technical position, and we wanted to get that tech in there that has to have some accounting background and so forth. So we wanted to do that particular swap. So overall, it's about a $20,000 increase. Which I think we felt that's appropriate. And just yeah. so the board knows, that's where our bread and butter's at. We, yes. I mean, <laughs> that's where we make the money so we can defer and, and move some of it to the sheriff's office and other offices. So it's really important for us to keep up on that. and and uh, do a good job in, in Tom's office, which well, he has it's, been. In it's the, scenarios so. like that where the department is, is doing their best with the vacancy and the ask, where instead of it being a $74,000 ask, it's now, a, sounds like a 20000 And so we need to start thinking that way with all of these asks. <clears throat> and, and that's why I wanted to hear from the departments, and I appreciate um, you know what you just shared with us. Thank you very much. Supervisor Dirk, you had a question? And I was just going to say, um, and with your particular position, we're probably going to make a lot of money, um, a lot more money faster. Yeah. Um, and so it'll pay for itself, essentially. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Tom. I, I think I think we, we got that resolved. I appreciate that. Great. Thank you very and much. And I'll invite up our CPO, if you, if you don't mind, Joe Fernella. Good morning, Madam Chair, board mm -hmm. members. Um, so the two positions that I asked for, uh, the, um, the IT and, uh, uh, position, uh, basically, uh, I'm going to ask AB 109. Originally, like uh, Sheriff Taylor said, uh, we were asked to bring the positions forward that we really feel like we need to have. That's one that, that will be covered, hopefully if uh, CCP agrees to it, and, and I, I hope that they will. So that, that one is not out of general fund. Um, our our um, uh, Juvenile Institution Officer 3, the, the issue that we have in and around that is um, we have a, a 2, a GIO 2 that covers it at this point in time, and uh, we have been running below standard to Title 15. And this, we were kind of uh, given a, a pass by our last inspector uh, because of that, uh, because of COVID and population was down at the time, but we're at a position where we need to have all four of our um, schedules. We have four different uh, shift patterns and one of those shift patterns does not have a JO3, which is a supervisor position uh, covering at this point in time. And this causes a trickle effect because we have a, a juvenile hall supervisor who is primarily for the administrative aspects of juvenile hall. Uh, she subsequently gets pulled to cover that shift on a regular basis, um, which is causing a lot of um, 
inability to actually uh, keep the operations of juvenile hall going smoothly. Um, that being said, <clears throat> in hearing today's uh, uh, talk about uh, issues, I, I actually think I can move to do that as a reclassification. Uh, through SB 823, we're going to have a higher demand. That higher demand is going to be if we have youth that have to go to another county, we're going to need a transportation officer. We're not yet at that point, um, but we do need to cover a GIO 2 position and maybe reclass it into a GIO 3 position instead of a whole new GIO 3 position. Um, so that should help out as mm. well. And I don't know if you have any questions in and around that, but I'll be happy to answer them. Madam Chair, uh, Chief Franchella, can you explain Title 15 requirements? So Title 15 is uh, through the Board of State and Community Corrections. And basically what it is is all the uh, mandates of the state in order to run a juvenile institution. Okay, so they have staffing patterns. You have to, for so many kids, you have to have uh, so many people in place and you have to have a supervisor position on every shift, which is the JIO3 position, which we are currently deficient in on one of our shifts. So um, does that explain it for yeah. you? So there's uh, staffing standards, basically. They have certain oversight requirements uh, relative to your staff. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Madam Chair, so, so, um, so what I'm hearing is that the, uh, the tech position you feel is going to get, if it's approved through the CCP, it would, be, uh, would not affect the general fund. Correct. And then um, instead of the 92000 for the juvenile uh, officer, if you, if you do the swap kind of a thing, how much, what, what would it reduce that down to? I'm not certain off the top of my head, but quite a bit less. It's just, uh, uh, it, it, it'll be, yeah. I was going to say it's going to be similar to that uh, position for the assessor's office or the, the 20,000 range. Probably, maybe. yeah, probably mm -hmm. a little bit less, maybe 10, 15. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that might be a That's good solution. Be, that'll be good. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate okay. that. I Thank think we you. got that result as well. I'd like to invite up Steve Loop, interim RMA director. All right, good morning, Madam Chair and the board. I will, based on what Sheriff Taylor had previously noted, I'll, I'll try to make your decision making a, a little bit easier. Um, for code enforcement officer, we currently have one contract employee and we have one approved position that we're trying to recruit and hire. Um, this would be a second permanent code enforcement, enforcement officer. So. If you have to make a choice between one of the sheriff's positions and a code enforcement officer, um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just trying to be realistic, right? And so um, we need one. Again, there's 1,400 miles. There's a lot in code enforcement issues. A lot of folks building things they shouldn't. But again, uh, sheriff would take precedent there. Um, regarding planning technician, uh, the RMA has, um, we are involved in a lot of meetings. Most of you are involved in those ad hoc meetings and evenings and days and, and those type of things. So planning technician is the main reason we're requesting um, some assistance in that regard. However, the assistant clerk of the board also could um, help out in that respect. So if the board so chooses, you know, to decide between one or the other or both, um, one or the other would be you know needed perhaps not both at least our planning technician our planning department has recently been um, staffed up through the help of uh, the HR department and our planning folks so um, so in a way those two uh, are, are similar functions and in, in my res in my perspective from the RMA director I would say um, and don't tell some of my folks, even though they're here in the room, that uh, the planning technician uh, isn't as urgent as some of the other positions. Hopefully, I think you've already um, understood that the two CSA positions would be self-funding, self-sufficient um, through a 218 process. So those should, in my opinion, um, you know, be approved by the board, hopefully. 
And then the last one I do want to mention, we'll talk a little bit more very soon, is a capital program manager. In the past, there has been an average of four construction projects ongoing and four design planning projects ongoing, so about eight-ish per year with the one position that we currently have filled. Currently, we have 14 projects active, um, 10 of them under construction, four under planning. And when we get into more details, um, technically, there's 17 projects that are going to be rolled over to this year, if the board so chooses. Um, four new projects that we're hoping for, a library and some parks projects. And then six department rollover projects from not capital facilities, but just department grants and other type of projects. So there's technically 27 projects that probably should be active next year um, in, in, in addition to the 14 that are ongoing. So actually, excuse me, that would include the 14 that are ongoing. So it'd be 27 total. It's a lot to handle for one person. So um, that's why we're requesting a capital program manager to assist in that regards. So thank you. Madam Chair. Thank you, Steve. Oh. Problem. Any questions? Okay, yeah. so go ahead. So, Cousin Mickey. Uh, what costs more between the the contracted code enforcement and the bringing somebody on? The contract does cost a little bit more when you can consider benefits and those type of things. I think, Abe. Um, but again, as Ray mentioned, when the contract, when the board says, "Okay, contract's over and we're not going to renew it," then right. um, yeah, so you understand. That. And then have we ever looked into other creative options because code enforcement is just kind of an inherently challenging area to fill positions and keep and and we do need code enforcement and you know I don't want to we certainly need sheriff's officers as well um, but we do need code enforcement along with a lot of other positions as we see in the room here um, but we also are constrained by you know finances um, but have we looked into other creative approaches for code enforcement such as partnering potentially with the city of Hollister um, as an option or anything else along those lines just to get us out of this rut at some point? It's a great suggestion. I don't, I don't think we have um, considered partnering. Um, we tried partnering with the cities on other issues and um, haven't had a lot of success, but uh, we can definitely look into that. It just seems like an area where there's, you know, whether it's the city or the county, they're dealing with you know, it just seems like an area where there might be efficiencies if, if there's potential there. Just a thought. So thank you. Good suggestions. Thank you. You know, one creative approach might be uh, in work with the sheriff's department is have code enforcement carry a gun. That might <laughs> that might solve a lot of problems. Um, seriously, uh, Steve, uh, one question I have is in the uh, capital program manager, and I, I kind of touched on this before, um, because we don't we don't have that position filled, are we are we farming that out, and how much are we spending, and if so, how much are we spending every year uh, to contract out you know that kind of oversight, um, and again you know we may. You know, we may be able to save the um, uh, 125,000 or so in that position, but if we're, if this board is later approving a $200,000, you know, contract, which we seem to to frequently do in RMA, it's kind of you know, good money after bad kind of thing. Have you looked at that when you got to factor in benefits, et cetera? So I'm just curious about that. We have, and um, there was a contract capital program manager on board earlier in the year. The contract is more expensive than a full-time county employee. Um, to have a consultant staffed for one year, it is more expensive. And that contract was ended after some projects were wrapping up. So we currently have no contract um, staff. We just have one yeah. capital pro project manager for all of our projects. Yeah, that was Damon Felice. Yeah. Oh, okay. And um, <clears throat> much like the assessor's office, is what would be the financial impact of not staffing this? Like, what what are the ramifications um, if we said we have twenty eight projects starting next year and we have no one to oversee that? Potentially, what are we looking at? 
would there be a financial impact of some kind? Is there more likely mistakes to be made and then that could cost the county? I'm just curious. That's a good question. I think the financial impact pertains to grants. A couple of our departments um, are very actively pursuing grants and, and being awarded grants. And so some of those 27 projects I mentioned are grant projects. And again, RMA capital programs um, projects, are, we have one person managing those as well. So yeah, there would be um, possibilities of not you know, being able to properly implement some of those grants. Some of the agencies help with that, but once it gets into say design and construction, that's when RMA takes over. The, the department will help on the back end with the invoicing and financing aspect, but we take over from you know, design and construction. That's when it comes to RMA. So. so how much, is there like a theoretical, how much money would we potentially, would that position pay for itself and then some? A lot of our, um, especially when we're working on those type of projects, they are absolutely reimbursable through that grant. So even our current position, Karen, a lot of her time is billable towards that grant. And so, you know, yes, her salary is X, but a large percentage of that is actually billed towards those grant projects. And so somewhat self-funding of a position, if that answers your question. So. If a quick follow-up, Steve. Um, we're looking at doing some uh, road work, some uh, capital projects through this um, bonding, through financing. Um, we have a three-year period to do it, and I recall that we would, you know, we would probably need a project manager to oversee that construction manager. Maybe that's not in-house. Maybe that's contracted. But I wonder how that plays into this conversation. If we were to go ahead with with approving that, and then we had all that on the plate, um, you know, at least for that three-year period, does it make sense to have that position? I'm also, you know, thinking to Supervisor Dirks's question. I remember you mentioned to me like with bridge work, yeah. it took us so long to, you know, to finally get it done. We run the risk that we're going to lose money from the state, which is a lot of money. So. I think that's that's a good question that Supervisor Dirks asked. We don't want to. So know. I mean, it, Madam Chair, if I may, in short, the answer is yes to Supervisor Dirks, and and potentially could owe or pay back the state, you know, potentially millions of dollars. If, and it's not just when you go when you apply for a grant, it's just not you're applying for it and all right, we got you know we got the money. There's a lot to it. You have to follow up. You have to show reports. You have to perform. Um, as part of the grant as well. So there's a lot of work that goes with, um, with once you get a grant, you got to do the other. And if you don't and you fail in that regard, you could also be penalized. So, so the answer is yes. It could, and it could be significant. So and hopefully that helps. In addition to that, and regarding Supervisor Tiffany's question, we actually do have one person as a consultant hired to help manage our bridge program. Um, we will be going out after the board returns over the summer to have another program management RFQ, RFP to, f to fill that position that's currently ongoing because we need someone pretty much full time to help us with all of our bridge projects so that we don't lose some of the funding that you just mentioned, but that is a consultant. Um, and then regarding the future bond projects or the projects we'll discuss um, that are beyond the CIP I would also recommend, um, and we'll, we'll have that discussion later, but we'll probably need a person to help manage those if, if we add, say, another 12 million per year, which would more than double what we're currently managing with road projects. Um, but we can have that discussion later, so. Yeah. But you feel that's best handled through a contract employee as opposed to a full-time employee, at I, least at this point? At this point, yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we'll, thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. We're going to go ahead and go to our last uh, department head, uh, Nara Conte, our librarian. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, thank you, Ray. Our CAO, excuse me, a little bit under the weather this morning. Um, good morning, board members and uh, members of the public and those that are watching at home. Um, 
but I wanted to share with you was just some thoughts about you know the library and where it was and where it's going. In order for a library to continue uh, to be responsive to the community, you've got to provide the services that they need. You've got to be able to show them that you're kept up. Well, we did a lot of things to try to do that. And many of you were very much part of that as well. But one of the things that I wanted to say is that we have applied for grants during the time that I've been with um, San Benito County. And it is work to acquire the grants. Just like our CEO Espinoza said, it's not just bringing in the money, it's the reporting and making sure that you have all of your deliverables and things like that. But for me, I'm a hard worker and I'm willing to, I'm willing to do that because I don't want our library to become a relic of the past. It's gotta stay in the present and it has to be responsive to this community. Recognizing that our community has so, our county has so many needs, we decided that we were going to go after some money that was out there, and we did. Over the past mm, 13, 14 years, we have had literacy funding that we didn't have in 06 when I came. But the state library, when I called them and said, you know, you have, you've not given to San Benito County in X amount of years. So they decided that they should, and they did. And they have made that commitment good to us for the last 13, 13 years. This year, totally from the State Library, because of our grants that we have, we have $130,000. And uh, so our ask takes nothing from the general fund. We, we bring the money in so that we're able to uh, keep our library abreast and afloat and in trend and be a responsive library to our community. We cannot have a program that no longer is tailor-made to fit the needs of the public. That's in the past. We've got to stay in the present for, for everyone concerned. So I asked the board to allow us to fill uh, these positions because, number one, it doesn't come from the general fund. We do need the, these positions. There's also something else that I'd like to point out. In 2006, when you first hired me, I'm going off the top of my head, but I think I'm pretty close to it. There were nine full-time benefited positions. Today, there's the equivalent of seven. We had to make a choice. We stay in the past, or we look at the challenges that we have, we go after funding, we've been able to pick some low-hanging fruit, brought in revenue, so that we will not become a relic and we will be responsive to the needs of the community. So please, board, um, I am hoping that you support these positions. They are grant funded, they have a good track record. The other choice is to give, it, give the money back because we need people to be able to fulfill the obligations of the grant. It's not just about books and supplies. It's about people being able to work with the community uh, to help their, what, what their needs are, whether it be in strengthening their, um, their English skills, their reading skills, working as, bringing them together as a family to be able to do literacy services. So those are, those are what we are, uh, do. So um, my message today, or my hope rather, is that um, the board supports these positions. They're not grant funded, but that are through grants. Thank you, board. Aaron, thank you. Madam Chair, oh, you can go first, Bob. Well, I was just gonna, Nora, excuse me, a question, or a few questions. Um, so how, if, if they're grant, grant funded, how long, are they yearly grants? And, yes. And, um, and I guess, if if one of these positions or both the positions were filled, let's say for this this year that you already have the grant, I gather there are already grant money available. If you don't get those grants the next year, would you just you would be forced to eliminate those positions? How would you? I mean, and I guess it ultimately my question is, would you prefer to 
fill those positions with the grants, even though knowing that um, there may not be money from uh, the general fund can't fill them if you don't get the grants for the following year? Is that what you would prefer to do? Well, you know, I haven't thought in that direction, quite frankly, because of the track record of the state and what they've done. You wouldn't expect past. that to happen. Yeah, I would not, because during the recession of 08, they did not deny our literacy funds. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Kosmicki. Thank you. So the, the grant in particular, what is the um, eligible use for the, gr the grant that we have? It's not just staffing I take, it's, can you we, explain? We have the flexibility therein to be able to divvy up the, the funding that comes from the individual grants. But what we are looking at is the need to have actual individuals to work in these particular areas with the public. That connection with the public, a human connection, is extremely vital when you're dealing uh, with uh, the type of needs that, we, that exist because they have to do with the quality of life, they have to do with upward mobility, they have to do with uh, bettering because you're able to um, increase your income. These are obstacles that stand in the way of individuals acquiring success, basically. But just to clarify, the money would technically come from the, the general fund because you... N no. No, we have grants. We have... Uh, uh, it, there are three grants, and they total $130,000. Unless I'm not understanding what you're asking me. We, these, these positions that we are asking for, that you approve, are paid through grants. A grant, grants that come in from the state library. Got it. Okay. okay. Um, but I do, I, I do just, um, just to go back to Supervisor Tiffany's, because I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't point this out, I get really concerned about funding, and I've said this openly, funding positions with one-time funds or grant funds, especially a one-year cycle, because I, if, you come, if, they, if it's not funded, for instance, next year or the year after that, I, for one, you know, we just have to eliminate those positions. We just have other, with all due respect, we just have other priorities. Um, so that, I just want to make that clear for me personally that as much as I support the library, just from a principal perspective, I get really... <coughs> Um, very leery about funding with one-time funding, which I consider this to be since it's a one-year grant. Well, it's a one-year grant, true, but it has been ongoing for about 13, 14 years. And like I said earlier, the track record of the State Library and their commitment to San Benito County, even during the recession, when there were libraries that were closed, we received our literacy money. So it would, so what I, you're saying. So in other words, uh, Supervisor Kosmicki, I'm very confident, I'm very confident that they'll, they're going to fund. It's a high priority in the state. But if they didn't fund it next year, would you come back and ask for general fund monies? I think, well, I would ask you, but you, that's not the only thing I would do. I, before I came to ask you, I would make sure that I turned every stone to see where else I could get it from. Mm -hmm. And I think I have a track record that proves yeah. that. And when you, when you presumably, if, if we funded this, would you be informing these employees, do their understanding that this is a grant-funded position? That Absolutely. Even it'd, be an L, it'd be an LTP position, a limited-time personnel position. So they'll, have to be, they'll be aware of it, and HR works um, through that process. So. Okay. Thank you. So, Wait, quick Wait. follow up. Oh. I, I'm a little confused. Um, these two positions uh, are brand new positions, or have they? Because I thought you said you've been for the last 13 years you've been getting grants, but they haven't been filling this. Th so these two are new positions that would be over and above. We explain have, that to we me. We have been piecemealing this together um, with temporary type situations, folks come in, they have an interest in, in, in doing literacy. We have absorbed uh, the, the workload when we have not been able to find someone. And through all of this, that's how we came to the conclusion that we could not continue to do it this way. We had to have these two positions to be able to do the job the way it's supposed to be done. We've been successful. 
But you've been using grant money to piecemeal it together up to right. now? Right. So now you're using the same grant money or some Abs grant money to actually have two positions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. And I think we'll be successful because um, they, they will be full-time benefited. And as our CEO said, the, we always, we're very upfront with people and we tell them that these are limited term type positions. Thank you, Board, for your um, support of the library. Thank you, Nora. Okay. Can we go to public comment on this aspect um, of it, you know, before we do the deliberations? And then what I would like, Gabriel, mm -hmm. is we've heard from the various departments, right. and it sounds like that two, um, 2.1 million may not be a correct number because there are grants, there are right. um, other fundings that are out, funding uh, sources available. So maybe if we can look at the realistic, what you're asking for us, because, yeah, um, yeah it sounds like we, we might be able to find a, a viable solution to this and, and, and so go ahead Gabriel I was gonna say and this is part of the reason uh, like I mentioned after we published it I'd been getting calls from the department heads after we kind of made the recommendations so this is more or less been a working meeting uh, so I've been getting a lot of feedback trying to figure out essentially what the impact so at the beginning the total impact would be two million if it was a complete ask of the general fund which that was what was at the beginning but now as we've been able to kind of work with the departments and figure out you know how can we leverage other funding or how to you know uh, essentially for some of them working with reclasses how to minimize the impact um, we can you know make it a little bit more reasonable and I just wanted to share typically that's what we do that's this is part of the process and and in there there is some highlights of other funding um, you know as like the 218 and we, we opened up in those but, comments so um, but just keep in mind the general funds always on the hook yeah uh, <laughs> so <laughs> that's the reason why it's labeled uh, you know as general mm -hmm. fund but you know definitely uh, Gabriel's been working hard with the department heads to try to find other other means to um, bring in staff and it's not just this year it's been we've done, been doing this for years so madam chair just for clarification because you said it was 2.1 million is not a correct number Correct me if I'm wrong, CAO, this is funds that we are putting on the hook today, and whether the cost recovery happens after the fact, that's a separate. No, no. This number here is just a representation of what the requests are from the department heads, from the department. Correct, but if, if it gets approved, the $2.1 million, we're not asking you to approve yeah, <laughs> to, because yeah. we will we do not yeah, we cannot we, afford it and we're not recommending that um, okay. and we're not to be honest with you what Gabriel was saying earlier is that there's some concerns about even recommending anything but the max that I think we feel comfortable with from administration is four hundred thousand yeah so Sheriff hence, Taylor was yeah. asking if he could one more he's and I don't know what that <laughs> one more means but <clears throat> is that one minute <laughs> about twenty more minutes of your time so. Um, this is actually a day where it's more difficult to be Gabriel than it is to be Eric, so sorry, Gabe. <laughs> but um, so I'm sitting back there and I'm, I'm racking my brain. I just want to say something to my new favorite person in the county, Steve, um, for being so kind about um, being willing to defer to our office. I want to support him and his staff and say that I'm here. I think it's really cool that we work here because you have a bunch of department heads out here fighting for their people, and that's what should happen, and that's what uh, you all get paid the big bucks for to make the hard decisions. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, uh, as easy as I can to not think my, make my staff think I'm not supporting them, but I know firsthand that a strong code enforcement division in a county or a city takes a heap of work off of the sheriff's office. And I wouldn't be honest with all of you if I didn't come up here and acknowledge the fact that I've been telling you that my office can't be the tip of the spear when we're talking about some of these homelessness issues and that the and that really the one of the remedies to that is a code enforcement division so as we move forward as a county together i am willing to defer some of my ass to make sure that rma is supported because whether my staff under, believes it or not if steve's able to have a functioning professional code enforcement division, we're all gonna be better off, my employees as well. So I didn't feel right closing out the meeting without acknowledging Steve and everything that they do and understanding just how important having this support staff is 
even to our office. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, one of the things that I, I was, I'm always so conscious of the time and I can get off to talking, but um, you know, library services, I was, as I was hearing the sheriff, you know, library services are also intervention services. So I uh, just wanted you to, to share that with you. So we're all really working kind of in the same direction at different, at different stages at different degrees. So I just wanted to share. Thank you, board. Thank you. Okay, so we let's go to open public. Yes. Public comment. Like to make a comment in chambers, please provide a speaker card on Zoom. You can press star nine on your phone or the raise your hand icon on your screen. Anita King, Kane. Yeah, hi. Um, so I just wanted to express my support for um, the RMA uh, Capital uh, Projects Manager position. It's it's really important um, with all these projects that are coming down the line that they have somebody on staff that can actually manage them. So without that, uh, it's, it's not a good thing at all. So I, I do express my support for that. Um, and this is coming from both REACH and the Historical Society. Thank you. Gina? Maria Spandry. Um, thank you for um, for your time, Madam Chair and Supervisors. So I'm Maria Spandry. I am the uh, Vet Veterans Park Commissioner Chair, and um, I too want to support Steve. He is an amazing. If you can make sure he stays with us and not just interim, I would really appreciate it. He's very workable and he's very helpful. And he and he's and and Gabriel, thank you so much. You guys have been amazing. Um, one of the things that if we don't approve what he's asking, that's going to impact the parks. I. Our park is one of those parks that is so used. If you ever go there on a weekend, there's no parking. There's, and, and right now, it is a safety issue. And we have so many things that need to happen at our park. And so if we don't approve what Steve is asking, we're put on the back burner again. He wants to apply for, for grants. And he, without that help, we have no ADA compliant bathrooms. And this is one of those things that I have said constantly for the years that I've been on this commission is that as a lot of my friends have special needs kids and to stand in a porta potty leaning against a, and trying to ch change an adult diaper, it really infuriates me. The bathrooms are substandard. They're horrible. You go in there and they smell like, I mean, it's just, they're horrible. Um, Safety is an issue because lighting around the park is just, you know, there's just so many corners and the sheriff does as much as they can in, in HPD, but you have all this drug activity going on at that park. That park is used, the most used park in San Bernardino County. When we have all these different sports groups and we have everything, but without Steve's help, there's no way that we can upgrade this. We have holes in our, in our concrete where if an ankle gets caught in there because of the ground squirrels, you're gonna break an ankle. Now we're talking liability. Everything is about what we need at that park is safety. And so, um, and, and we're just so behind on what other counties have. With the amount of use this park has, it shouldn't be in, in, the, in the state that it's at. We have been put to the back burner for years and years and years. You go out there, we have this building in front that we don't even, I don't even know what's in that building, but I can tell you it's, it's a safety hazard. I've seen children standing on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, J trying to jump down and but without Steve's help we can't upgrade this field and so please consider um, consider that because the impact for the parks it's so frustrating to be on this commission because we feel like we're never heard Steve is really Steve and Mike have really been stepping up and listening to us and so without their help I, I really don't know what so I appreciate you. I just want you to know that. And please stay. Don't go anywhere. We've gone through three or four since I've been on the commission. And it's been so frustrating because we start all over again every time. And so thank you for all your work. Um, but please make sure that, that he stays. And, um, and, and without him, our park that's used for every sports in town by hundreds and hundreds of people, please consider what their needs are. Thank you. Thank you. One quick comment. I know there's probably some public comments to relation to some of the other items on the presentation. So 
I don't know if the board or the chair wants to hear all the comments now, even though they may not pertain to the positions. I, I think we'll go ahead and continue, Madam Chair, okay. with your direction. I, yeah. Go ahead and listen to the comments, because I think it's relevant to the positions themselves, and I think the board needs to hear. Gina? Good morning. My name is Gina Nadi, and um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to address the board. My concern um, is with Vets Park. Um, I'm with Hollister Heat. I'm the vice president and been on their board for the last six years. Um, our main concern is safety. We have, like Maria said, we have Babe Ruth, Hollister Little League, Hollister Recreation, Hollister Heat, the Tremors, and the Skate Park. Um, Little League has 500 um, players. Babe Ruth has over 100. Hollister Heat has 300. We are kicking off our um, fall, our, our fall bar travel season. We have over 100 and with five teams. Um, Tremors has close to 500 players. And the rec, um, I can't speak on exactly how many, but they have little um, giants. They have their adult league. Um, so what she's stating that our park is busy is an understatement. I'm not sure if any of you have visited the park. Besides being proud, um, with the veterans and people um, loving the park. Our parking lot is a danger zone. Our exit and entrance to the park, you can go there any anytime and um, it's a hazard on a Saturday. We go out there and we have to um, do traffic. There's no striping, there are no lights. Um, she's right spot on on our restrooms, we clean them ourselves. Um, the county has people come on Sunday morning that are um, from a program and they clean them, but that's Sunday to Sunday. Every Saturday during the season, which runs, well, the parks use year round, but our softball and our baseball season run, um, I'll say February through, through the summer. Parking lot is full, the, there is no striping cars go in and out um, there's children running back and forth so I'm asking that you be proactive before something happens to a child mom sometimes moms have to watch two games so kids are running back and forth there there's no rhyme or reason it's so dangerous it's dangerous during the day and the drug activity at night is because there's no lights there's no lights in the parking lot we have lights on the field, but the lights on the field go off. During the day, there's no striping. So when we have, a, you know, how many kids there on a Saturday, we, we run 300 on a Saturday in and out. So that's 300 cars, not counting grandparents. So if you have a little league going and no striping, I th so I've been to three meetings. I'm new at this. Um, I know that every time I go to a meeting, it's like, oh, well, the lighting was approved, but, um, and it was in the budget, but, oh, he left. So where was that 75,000 and where did it go? Because it was already, 75,000 for lights was already approved from what we were told prior. So my concern is too, okay, well, I understand now that that 75 went back into the general fund and there's no tracing it so we don't have lights. So to push this under again to something that's already been approved, if something happens to a child at that park that is the most used park in San Benito County, it's on all of us. I, I, I thank you, you've gone over your time, but I thank, thank you for you. your concerns. Valerie Eglund. Thank you, Board. Um, Valerie Eglin, Reach San Benito Parks Foundation. Um, I'm also uh, concerned with, with our RMA and the requests for uh, a project manager uh, with the funding of the regional park. Uh, we desperately need to have uh, a good movement forward. And uh, I know that Steve 
Loop is doing an excellent job, but they're so overburdened. Uh, the code enforcement as well. Uh, but with our parks, our parks are increasing our economy. Uh, they decrease gang activity, uh, and they are a respite for multiple generations of people using the park. So the regional park is going to increase all those safety factors in the community with uh, an education component as well as recreation for our community. It will also decrease commuter activity because all the commuters during the week need some place to go without leaving town. So that regional park and moving it forward with good project management is, is extremely important. Thank you. Thank you. On Zoom, you've been unmuted. Please state your name. You have three minutes. Yes, yes my, my name is Sandy Patterson, and I live in just in just district one, and I've been here fifty years. Miss Miss Patterson, we can't hear you. Is it possible for you to um, disconnect and reconnect? I know last week um, a couple of viewers from participating by Zoom were having difficulty, so um, please sign back in and, and we'll give you the opportunity to speak. You've been unmuted. Please state your name. You have three minutes. Good morning. My name is Celeste. Uh, first, I wanted to state that um, for the Sheriff's Department, thank you for not lowering the standards. We don't want to become a San Jose 2.0. So uh, please fund them. And then for the assessor, uh, that's an obvious yes. And for the probation department, I do want to emphasize on Title 15 and how important it is to have a supervisor on shift every shift. Um, I have worked there in past, uh, it was one of my jobs and it, that is just a very crucial position and um, the, because the training is not up to par for all the part-timers and the supervisors um, are very knowledgeable and have all the up-to-date training. So that is important. And then I do want to speak on the code enforcement officer. Um, I'm a little confused because I know we had, a, a, what is it, two positions for code enforcement throughout these past few years. Is this an additional position? Like we're, we are adding more code enforcement officers or is it because the other ones are not no longer there and we just need to continue this position? Uh, because one was, uh, well, code enforcement is important within our community. So, um, and then for the library, I do think our library is very important in our community. Um, unfortunately, we do have some community members who still feel unsafe to attend because of their vaccine status and um, don't feel um, that is a safe place for them to be there. But I understand that our library is important. I just hope that all are welcome, whether it vaccinated or not. Thank you, have a good day. You've been unmuted. Please state your name. You have three minutes. You've been unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, of course, again, Sandy Patterson. I live in District 1. Like I said, I've been here 50 years. I support uh, Eric Taylor and the Sheriff's Department 200% because I know how important they are. I lived on Pinoch Road. Uh, during the budget cut in 2011. And when the response time from the Sheriff's Department to uh, our area was a half an hour. Yeah. So we had to have our own little community and take care of ourselves. Um, so it's very important that he gets what he needs uh, from 2011 to 2022. There's been an increase of almost 11,000 residents. Are we are 
is the sheriff's department at their per capita. It's one, it's one law enforcement officer per every thousand residents. Uh, you have, he's five, uh, down five right now. Is that patrol division? He needs to, that needs to bring back up. People I've talked to in district one uh, and district four, I have friends all over the county. This is important to them and they need to be staffed. I, I give him, uh, you know, for, you know, referring to the back to the code enforcement officer. Uh, of course, I'm going to say, uh, stating to arm a code enforcement officer, you have no idea, Supervisor Tiffany, what it takes to get certified and to know how to shoot a weapon. So, and I put a challenge to any one of the board members to go out and actually do a ride along and not day shoot and see what these officers go to, or go out and work a shift out at the out at the jail or the juvenile institute, you know, the juvenile hall. I used to be on the juvenile justice commission. I did inspections out there. So I know what these people go through. So they need to be supported. Everybody's important. And to the CAO that yes, everybody does work hard, but the people that work within a building that not there that are not out there protecting and serving and putting their lives on the line with a weapon on their hip, you have no clue. So I support uh, Sheriff Taylor and um, he needs to be supported by the board. And, uh, and uh, so he can take care of the residents of San Benito County. Thank you. No other comments. Okay. Joe Pog Gonzalez, go ahead. Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to bring up that uh, as a department head, uh, I've had many projects um, before, um, before this board to be approved. But I could tell you that I, I can't think of any that have been completed because we haven't had a follow through in in completion of those projects. We really, really need a capital projects manager because the expenditures that are approved by you are not being um, are, are not being fulfilled because there's a lack of staff to be able to do that. And um, I can tell you that we have some very important projects in the Hall of Records for elections that is vital to the security of elections and it, these projects have not been completed and and it's been over over several years and I, I really would appreciate it i know the the other department heads would really appreciate if if you could um uh ensure that we you know we have the the necessary staff to get the projects completed thank you thank you Madam Chair, if I may, I just want to um, comment, um, not disagreeing with um, Joe Paul Gonzalez. I think we're limited, so limited on staffing. There have been some fairly large projects like the jail, um, behavior health building. So there's been some pretty large projects. However, the only one person <laughs> to do that. So what I think he's referring to is that there's a lot of little projects like the old courthouse addressing those things. So some of those things have been kind of put on the side to deal with these other projects that we have to get completed within a certain period of time because of, of financing and other, other matters. So all of the attention goes over there. So I just had to highlight it. I think with regards to just to add to that, I think it's there's so many projects and I have to agree that there needs to be some help with that and to be able to complete them. So just wanted to highlight that. Madam yes. Chair, I was wondering if we we're going to add commentary today to uh, give our input on what we prefer. Uh, I, it was after it came back to us, so I'm, I think we're finished with public comment. Did you have a, another public comment card there? I know Ms. Kane had wanted to address something, and we're trying to give those people that are here the opportunity. Yeah. Um, Anita Kane? Sorry, Ms. Kane. 
But we will do that, yes, momentarily. Supervisor. Yeah. Thanks. I didn't realize you were addressing the capital projects uh, comments at this time. We kind of so. weren't at the time, yeah. but it's. Yeah, so here I am again. So um, as, as the director of the historical village there at the historical park, um, I'd like to encourage the board to fund improvements to the park's water system, um, restrooms, and staffing. Now, I, I realize Steve didn't ask for extra staffing, even though he really, really needs it out there. Um, but uh, the, the potable water situation is, is awful, and it, it, it contributes to the uh, deleterious bathrooms out there, which uh, the toilets are elderly, they're quite fragile, and a busy day at the park renders them non-functional. And that's not acceptable, given the hundreds of visitors that are there on a busy day. The park is very well loved by the community and it's so well used and, and they deserve a better situation there with the bathroom and the water situation. Um, at the historical village, we, the historical society, we're all volunteers out there and we do all, all that we do with donations and grants and so uh, just requesting that the county <coughs> provide the budget to address the uh, deteriorating facilities and deferred maintenance of the recreational side of the park. That would be most appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. There's also another uh, comment on Zoom. We deviated, we must deviate alike. You've been unmuted. Please state your name. You have three minutes. You've been unmuted. No other comments. Okay. Thank you. All right, so Supervisor Kosmicki, did you want to go ahead first since you're inquiring our deliberations? Um, yeah. And then Gabriel, when you're thinking of your numbers, can was, you kind of give us, I was gonna say and again, it's not that it's an unrealistic number, there's just been some changes, and so yeah. can you help us with the changes? I was gonna say if you want me to, while public comment was happening, I ran the numbers. Perfect. If, if you want me to share them first, or if you- Yes, yes please, and then that way we can kind of- Okay. And, and Madam Chair, if I might, I gather we're gonna take these things one at a time. So we're gonna be getting to the roads and capital projects. We're gonna be getting to- we're d Yeah, we're just wrapping up the FTEs. We're just gonna wrap up this one Try part. to f finish this one right. part, and, and then, then we're, we're gonna invite Steve up to actually right. present the- uh, Right, and we'll be CIPs. able to comment later on those issues. Okay, thank you. Sure. So, uh, Throughout the conversation, the two million, two point one million dollar ask has now shrunk to one point nine million. Yes. With the trade offs or potential trade off if we consider the clerk of the board position and the planning tax. So if we eliminate one, give way to the other, that's seventy thousand uh, or so that's saved. Uh, some of the departments, for example, the assessor's office and the probation department, if we go forward with their reclass. Uh, we'll be saving about 110,000 or so. So that drops us, like I mentioned, down to about 1.9 million. Out of that 9.1, once I take apart uh, positions funded by AB 109 grants, the 218 process and uh, the program manager, which is a shared expense throughout uh, the different projects that they're working on. Um, I would say safely maybe half of the cost for that program manager goes to the general fund, so it's a general fund cost. At that point, what is then a true general fund ask take into consideration all those is a little bit over 1.3 million. Um, the cost of those positions are the sheriffs, uh, the clerk of the board slash planning tech position, uh, the reclass uh, minimal expense for the assessors, the clerk recorder election position, uh, the reclass for the probation, uh, the juvenile institution officer, uh, the staff analyst contribution, 38,000 out of the general fund, and uh, code enforcement officer, 100% general fund, and uh, like I mentioned, the. The, the other one was just a trade-off between the planning tech and the clerk of the board. So totaling those costs, it's uh, $1.3 million essentially. Not as low as I would have liked, but okay. So $1.3 number is a more realistic number. Go ahead, Supervisor President McGee. Thank you. Um, just for context, I mean, it would be great if we could please everybody. Um, but I think, as the CAO mentioned, it's, it's really is a wish list. And... Mm -hmm. um, I think it would it really would behoove us to I think it's really important for us to to listen to our staff and the recommendation we've gotten today which 
um, which is financially responsible. I think if we do anything beyond that, I, I, we're really putting ourselves in potentially mm -hmm. hot water. And um, down, not only just right around the corner, down the line, I, I just see some major issues. So um, I tend to agree with the recommendation to hold the line and come back mid-year to see if our economic situation is less tenuous. Um, and, but I'll get to maybe um, if we do put some of the funding, what I see is perhaps the, a couple of the priorities. Um, as far as, um, you know, our financial situation, we all know we rely heavily on property taxes and we have ex extraordinarily, I think, thin margins as far as how we deal from year to year. Um, and any significant shift in the economy, uh, particularly the real estate market, would have a profound effect on our budget and we would be looking at layoffs pretty quickly after that. And so that's really my concern is just really being as fiscally responsible right now as possible. I don't want to keep bringing up other agencies, but we've had situations locally in the recent past where, you know, spending on personnel with one-time funding and less stable funding has not worked out at all. Um, I'm very concerned basically about the state of our economy. And um, there's a growing consensus in everything that you look at and read that we're in a downturn or we're heading into a downturn. And um, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to uh, get in a, get ourselves in, like I said, in a position where we're coming back, um, you know, and, and doing layoffs. That would be really troubling to me. Um, I also want to point out the board has approved 3% pay increases for the next two years. I think that was a really um, I think it was the right move, but I also would say I think that was that was a pretty generous, you know, offering by the county um, across the board, along with three thousand dollar COVID hazard pay. Um, and so I, I just don't feel like we have the financial bandwidth to have it both ways where we are right now with just our limited revenue sources um, to do, you know, healthy pay increases and to do healthy position increases. It just it just doesn't add up. Um, so anyhow. If we're going to fund any of the positions, uh, then I also would say, um, aside from maybe a couple of them being fiscally conservative, if, if we want to fund, you know, beyond a couple positions, I would just recommend that if you're going to ask for that as a board or staff, that we also bring how what cuts are we going to make to make to offset those increases to our budget. You know, that's the only. You know, if we want to add five, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever it is, positions, then I would just highly recommend that um, if you're bringing that to the table, then please offer how we're going to cut somewhere else in the budget to get there. Um, so I'm almost done here, but you know, I think we all want to keep building our organization from a personnel standpoint. Um, but I also have to point out that we have this other factor that we're going to be talking about in the next part of this discussion, which is capital projects and road projects. And there's a reason why we have hundreds of millions of dollars, in my viewpoint, in deficit, basically, to our infrastructure. It's because we have put too much money, honestly, to we've, over the years, we've just put too much money into personnel, and we haven't put anything into infrastructure. And at some point, we have to start wonder, thinking, how are we going to at least gradually make that shift? And if we put too much money into adding new positions now, we're just not going to have money to do these projects, the capital projects and the road projects that we all know that we have to get done and that our residents have told us again and again that that is their priority. A um, couple last things. Uh, you know, I see a lot of opportunities with grant writing. We've heard from staff about you know, staff about um, grants that they're going out for. At some point, I would like to have a discussion about, a serious discussion about how we have a more structured protocol for grant writing, whether that means going out for a contracted grant writer or bringing a grant writer on staff, because that's the type of position that we know ultimately can pay very significant dividends and more, uh, more than likely, if you bring on the right person, will pay for that itself and much more than that. Um, I don't personally believe staff should be really spending any time on grant writing. I don't feel like that's our staff's area of expertise, and I feel like our staff should be more focused on, and I'm not criticizing you at all, Nora, here. I appreciate that you're applying for grants because we don't have a grant writer, and I appreciate all the staff that are taking that, fitting in that time, because we, we all know you're all squeezed 
for time. And I, and I do appreciate the time that's being put into it. I would like to see us take some of that burden off the staff at some point and really truly commit to a grant writer of some kind so that our staff can focus on these other areas. Um, and then if we are going to add positions, I, I agree with generally, I agree with holding the line until mid-year. Um, I, I would personally be willing to consider, um, you know, a couple of things. I think the capital, I think the pro capital project manager, I think we do have to hire that person, at, you know, relatively soon. I, I don't, it, you know, we're trying to get a lot of stuff done. And, we're, and again, we're going to see in the next portion of this meeting that we have a lot of capital work that needs to get done. And just, it's not, Steve can't do this all himself and the couple of people he has on staff. I mean, he's not Superman. I wish he was. Um, and I, but I do agree with all the positive comments about Steve and he's been great, but, um, but, but we can't get the projects done if we don't have somebody overseeing them. So I think that's the one position for now that I think for me, I'd be willing to bend on and, and everything else for the most part, aside from the assessor swap, I think certainly that makes sense. Um, for me, we'd have to wait till mid year to just see where we're at because the economy is just so tenuous right now. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to go next? Supervisor <clears throat> Hernandez. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Yeah, um, although I tend to agree with Supervisor Kosmicki on um, the situation with cost, I don't agree with getting into debt. Obviously, that I think we're in a bad position. I think we've been in, honestly, in a bad position for a really long time as a county. The fact that we have to figure out whether we pick public safety over over projects and like we're having a basically a, a pit to a certain extent departments pick departments one over the other. I think puts us in a tough position as it stands. I mean, we're to me the biggest issue is the fact that we we don't have a the public having a clear understanding of the fiscal st state of the county. That <clears throat> makes it really hard, right? Because then ultimately it becomes very easy for for a, a potential landlock initiative that's ultimately going to uh, you know put put a commercial development opportunity it, into an election cycle and have that per that person or that that entity have to pay for the cost on a risk of hoping that the voters would approve one commercial development. That to me is, is a dangerous initiative, but that's because of the reality of what we're dealing with the county. Um, I do believe we should be funding these positions. My struggle with this whole thing is, uh, and I don't want to get into debt, I do believe we also have to have a serious conversation about what it means to educate our, our county employees on the potential if we do have to um, cut back. But there, I, I, I just haven't heard enough conversation about what does it look like? How do you prove a negative? What does it look like to have to basically mitigate the current risk situation with our staffing levels? If someone, if we don't have the response times out in South County like we need, and then all of a sudden someone dies because of that, or if we don't have uh, the safety elements within our, our parks that are necessary to prevent, you know, injury, the ADA, you know, I have gone into the bathrooms and my son actually plays Little League Baseball, so I, I entered into the bathrooms and it stunk like ammonia really, really bad. Um, there's issues, but when we're having to defer maintenance or taking care of just our average needs, um, that puts us in a really tough position. You know, we're dealing with basically, and I do agree with Supervisor Kosmicki, right? We've, we've been generous with a 30% raise. We're dealing with an inflationary cycle where it was basically it's 8%, which basically means you're still in the negative. Every family is going to have to pay $560, $600, I've heard was the estimates, still more for the same uh, revenues. So that means we're, we're already struggling as, as individuals in, in this country. Um, and in a small rural county where we have very limited resources and we really are a, a, a one-horse show, uh, we're struggling to be able to, to produce revenue. We have one gas station and it's out in Tres Pinos, right? That doesn't really make up for a lot, which basically makes us very dependent upon housing, which I know means Supervisor Kosmicki don't agree with increasing the, the impacts of housing and ultimately not being able to address the impacts themselves. Um, so my point is, is we, we need, I think we need to have a conversation is ultimately tell the truth to the county employees about the potentials of, of layoffs. But just the same, I do believe we have to consider what it means to be at a, at a place where our county has the, 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 the needs addressed to be able to maybe um, manage the resources needed to maybe go after grants to be able to make sure we're protecting the public um, and ultimately to provide the resources necessary. It's a hard conversation, but I think, you know, we're going to find ourselves in a tough position if we don't staff 
at a necessary level. We need to know what, it is, what is too low and uh, what are we not willing to sacrifice. And I don't think we've had that conversation yet because it's hard to prove a negative again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Supervisor Dirks. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the comments from both Supervisor Kosmicki and Supervisor Hernandez. I think, um, you know, you both bring up really good points. And so I'm just going to kind of add to that. Um, my big concern, and I think to go off of what Supervisor Hernandez was saying, is that we need the people. We need the people to do the work. If we don't have the people to do the work, then we're not going to have any impact on anything else. And so, um, so that that's kind of where where I stand a little bit too. I appreciate um, really the department heads. You all are doing a really great job at persuasively trying to explain where each of you are coming from. Um, you know, I think all of us would tend to agree. In in an ideal world, we'd like to just say yes, yes, yes. And um, safety is a huge concern. And it is, you know, I'm like, are people fed? Are they housed? And are they safe? Um, both phys physically and mentally, that's kind of where I stand. And so with that, I mean, all, all of the people who talked talked about safety, um, talked about well-being, um, every single department can could speak to that. And, um, you know, I'm willing to, to look at these different things and say, okay, yeah, we need to, the probation swap with the 20, you know, it sounded to be about an additional $20,000 assessors, an additional 20,000, um, with the swap that they did, the clerk of the board and the planning department kind of working together there. Um, that seems super reasonable as well. We need a capital project person in order to make those projects happen and not to lose money in the long run. I mean, I'm looking at this from what's paying for itself and and where where do we go from that? And so all and then the elections department as well and looking at least at one of those positions and, and funding it um, that way too. I mean, the foundation of our democracy kind of you know is relying on some of the different things that we're looking at as far as elections go. Uh, so so all of those things play in to all of this. And then code enforcement, I think uh, my district in and of itself is <laughs> becoming like warranting its own code enforcement officer. I don't know what's happening. I don't know if the sun's out and now people are like mm -hmm. really pissed at their neighbors. I'm not sure what's going on. But in any case, um, I'm getting more complaints about code enforcement than I am about potholes now. And so um, I think, you know, those are those are some real issues. And I've had to, and to uh, Sheriff Taylor's point, um, you know, because code enforcement is so overburdened right now, you know, I had to turn to him and say, hey, you're going to get a phone call because I feel like there's some threats that have been exchanged even between some neighbors in my district that go above and beyond code enforcement. So now the sheriff's department has to get involved, um, you know, and so all of it is cyclic or, you know, it's cyclical and it goes around and around and around we go. Um, so I do think that we need to look at some of those things. You know, I know that we're understaffed um, with the sheriff's department. I know you're looking at that. I mean, can we be creative in looking at this part of the process and say, okay, you know, Sheriff Taylor, if all of a sudden you do get an influx of 10 really great candidates, um, instead of waiting the six months, can you come back to us and can we reassess at that particular time and say, hey, you know, he has really 10 great, really good candidates. It's not the six month mark, but can the Sheriff's Department come in real time and say, hey, can we get one or two more positions? We have some really qualified candidates. I mean, I'm willing to look at it on a case by case basis from that standpoint too, uh, because our people do need to be safe and um, all, of the, all of this factors in. So yeah, we need all of these different positions and we need to, to look at this and, and uh, Supervisor Kosmicki brings up a really good point. At the same time, we can't go into debt and I am really concerned about layoffs. No one wants to be in that position and then to come back and say, okay, well, here we are. You know, this is what we were worried about. Um, I think as long as people are really clear as to where we're at and that if we do go into a recession, these are the implications that we're looking at. And is it, you know, is it last in, first out? 
you know, what are, what are we looking at at that point? Um, and really making our position on that, that clear as a board too. Um, because no one wants to tell someone that you're not going to be able to feed your family next month or whatever the case may be. Um, because that's really awful too. So I think really communication and transparency is very clear. It needs to be very clear at this point. Um, so that's, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I wish um, everyone in our county could be listening in or attend this, attending this meeting. Obviously, it's not possible, but, um, you know, we've talked about this a lot. Um, there's just a tremendous need for everyone to get educated. Supervisor Hernandez talked to it. Uh, we all have talked about it. Um, I mean, nothing could better illustrate the, you know, why we need more revenue in our county, as you pointed out in the beginning, Gabe, uh, than this conversation. I mean, there are real impacts um, to our citizens because we don't have enough revenue. And yet, here we are as a community seriously looking at passing an initiative that will totally uh, gut our ability to bring in more revenue through, um, you know, business development. Um, building more houses doesn't bring in more revenue. It barely covers the infrastructure um, impacts that it has, if, if it does cover it. So um, as a community, um, <laughs> I mean, we, we just, uh, we have to get more revenue and, um, you know, if this initiative passes or we turn our back on other potential projects, then the, you know, people need to understand the consequences. And um, anyway, with that being said, um, I do think that we have to be fiscally uh, responsible here. We have to be very careful. Uh, obviously, we can't fill all these positions uh, as much as we would like to. There's strong arguments for all of them. Um, you know, I have I have mixed feelings. I, I understand uh, the recommendation to hold off for the moment, um, and that may make sense. Although, um, you know, for me, priorities are, you know, number one above and uh, beyond everything is is the is the sheriffs. I think we have to get uh, more law enforcement out there. Um, obviously, I'm very concerned, particularly about South County. Um, I mean, that's three, three quarters of the geographic area of the county. And um, I'm sure many, many people out there don't drive down there regularly, but um, it's, it's a hell of a long ways down there. And if, and if, if there's no one down there and there's something that happens, uh, you're talking about an hour to hour and a half to get down there in some cases. So uh, it's a huge concern for me and I think for all of us. Um, so that would be my first priority, uh, head and shoulders above everything else. Um, second priority would be code enforcement. Um, I do think it is, uh, it is a huge problem in our community. Uh, what Supervisor Dirks has said is it's, it's true and there's just, frankly, there's, uh, people know that we're not gonna enforce anything because we don't have the people to do it. Um, and so we have to address that, and it does create, as Sheriff Taylor said, it creates a problem for them as well if it's not addressed. My thir third priority would be the capital programs manager. Um, if we don't have that, then we potentially, um, you know, are penny-wise pound fool foolish because we're going to be losing money in other ways. Um, I do think, uh, you know, some of these swaps that, and I appreciate, um, you know the willingness to work with us on this but you know uh twenty thousand uh potentially for the assessor officer twenty thousand for probation it uh, probably it certainly makes sense uh, i'd be willing to um uh go ahead with uh the library positions um with the understanding that those are from grants um only they do not impact the the general fund and with the understanding uh, we, that, although I know that, uh, Nora, you're uh, very confident that uh, if, if the grants don't get approved next year, that those positions would, would be 
would would likely be eliminated unless we suddenly are getting significantly more revenue. So at any rate, with that being said, um, uh, I would like to see probably, and I was just playing around with the numbers, probably um, at least a couple of the sheriff deputy positions uh, funded now so that um, we at least are getting a start there. Um, and I don't know how that would work, uh, Sheriff Taylor, with, with what your need is, but it, it would get us going in that direction. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, this is a little over 200000 and then potentially look at a couple of the other positions as well. But I, I do agree we have to be fiscally responsible. Uh, we just don't have, you know, don't have the revenue, plus um, who knows where the, the economy is, is going right now. Anyway, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, that's that's tough to kind of follow up with the the, the four different opinions and suggestions from the supervisors. Um, um, as I said from the very beginning, safety is my number one priority, and if I had the ability, I'd put it all in safety. But I don't have that. But that is a priority that I would like to the board to to hear that we definitely look at the possibility. And I appreciate your suggestion, Supervisor um, Tiffany. You know, at um, one or two positions there, I understand the the essential nature of having the capital projects uh, manager. Um, in order to be able to move forward and get that taken care of, but that's uh, um, 124,000 out of the 400, and so it's a significant purchase. When we're looking at only 400,000 to be able to um, to maneuver in this time frame, um, and I don't um, dis discard or put at a, a lesser value all of your ask in terms of your departments. It's just that if we're looking at a 2.1, well. 1.3 now million ask it's it's kind of difficult to to be able to buy all that and purchase all that when we only have 400,000 um, you know um, in in our budget um, but I would like to to go ahead and make sure that we give serious considerations to the positions that are going that are going to pay themselves back and bring in the revenue so um, as Supervisor Tiffany had mentioned, the library position, it's its an ask on paper, but it really isn't financially because it's gonna be funded um, through grants, and so I would hope that we would look at that one seriously. Uh, I look at the assessor's office, and that's essential. Without their property taxes, granted, we're only getting 11 cents on the dollar, but every dollar's gonna, gonna matter, so that would be the one that we definitely need to take into consideration. I know our staff here, in terms of um, the clerk of the board, that they are overworked with all the various meetings that we're having, but I do like the um, uh, the suggestion to go ahead and somehow work that with the planning um, uh, technician and somehow work that out. I do greatly appreciate the um, the swaps with the various departments in terms of um, it only costing us twenty thousand. So going back to the assessor's office, thank you very much. Um, the reclassification um, positions that were mentioned. I hope we can go ahead and, and focus on that. And then going back to code enforcement, uh, thank you, Sheriff Taylor, for for you know allowing us to give that a priority for consideration. Uh, we all saw during the, the COVID period and everything that was happening, code enforcement was definitely taxed at the city and at the county. And so that's definitely a, um, a no-brainer that we need to focus on that. So I can't give my priorities in terms of what I would like first, but I'm just hoping that as we continue with this presentation we don't have to give our ask right now ray can we go yeah, we, ahead and we, wait until we got clear i got clear direction we got clear direction okay. we'll come back and we'll work on that we'll work up with the department heads and we'll we'll um present this back to your board during the Ma hearings. madam chair can i make one quick suggestion after hearing yes um i what i kind of heard and, and i as a compromise because i was sort of on the more let's hold off and obviously that's that's not the way the board's going yeah um i Everything Supervisor Tiffany said seemed to make sense to me. Um, yeah. You know, if you add two deputies, you add yeah. program manager, that gets you pretty close to the two swaps. Yeah. Um, and then for me, I would say, um, you know, since we're, we have a vacancy in code enforcement, I, I believe that's what I heard. We're trying to fill that vacancy. Maybe have that as one of those mid-year look backs because um, that would basically take us to the four hundred thousand dollar recommendation. So the yeah the two deputies about two hundred k assessor thirty ish k uh, probation twenty ish k depending 
probably uh, program um, project manager 124k. So that's um, 200, 300. It's almost 400 right there. Um, just with those positions, that's kind of what I heard as well from the board. Kind of a take on that, and we can look. At, we'll look really closely at funding some of these other positions with other funding, with like AB 109 money, yes. um, with grants and other things. Uh, the 218 and um, the code enforcement. We could, you know, there's a potential of us actually having that position um, active, just not funded. And then come back to your board mid-year if we need to um, with the refunding request. And when we mentioned code enforcement, that was um, my hope that we we're looking at the safety out at Vets Park and the activity that's happening out there, that that would be a, a position that can help regulate uh, the illicit activity that's happening. Yeah. Just to add on to the, I, and the library too, I, as long as there's a clear understanding yeah, that the, yeah, we, and with the grants, that's good. And, yeah, and they what I was thinking down the road that wouldn't necessarily be at the top of the priority list. Um, but but I think there is value to that as long as they are, they're grant funded. Yeah. Sorry, I'm done. Thank you. So I think we got direction. If that's okay with your board, and yeah, I meant to mention um, Supervisor Kosmicki brought this up. Am I right? We do have on board a. Um, We've hired a firm that we're working with on, oh, yeah. on grant writing. Yeah, so we that have a presentation. That is a huge in, area, and, and there is a huge need there. So I, I want to be sure that that. We have a presentation in June with your board. We've already met with the grant writer. We've been meeting with the departments. Um, they already uh, started working on grants for us um, with a focus on um, many different facets of your priority, the roads, infrastructure. Uh, library, many other, you know, homelessness. So they're they're already started working on it. We're gonna, they're going to come back. They're going to present to your board in June, one of the meetings in June, and then um, we'll, you know, you guys can be able to have some open dialogue with them. And then also, when we get into the capital projects, I'd like to hear uh, us. And I don't know if it's in there, but. I've heard you know comments about the park and the lights in particular. So, yes. so I'd like that addressed. I mean, that's not part of the the position request, but the yeah. So that definitely we should be talking about. Yeah, that. I want to know what happened to that 75 and why did not the lights go in? And so yes, but so we'll I think get to that when you get to your presentation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. N now I do know that there was a suggestion to take a, a break, but that was almost a half an hour ago. So um, it looks like we're going to be going for longer than you had anticipated. Um, are, are we breaking? For, <laughs> are we breaking for lunch at all? Because no. Nope. And if we're no, not, we're, then, we're not breaking for lunch. Okay. Then yeah. maybe just a nice. Fifteen more minutes left in the presentation per Steve. So I'm going <laughs> to hold him to it. No. <laughs> uh, Th then th let's, go generous, ahead. let's go ahead and follow <laughs> no. the suggestion that to go ahead and take a, a bio break for let's go seven minutes and then we'll come back and resume um, the presentation. Okay. Sounds so. good. So f what? Uh, till what time? Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes? minutes? What, okay. Yeah. So then we'll, we'll go five after five after twelve. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I saw that as as twelve. Okay. Just five minutes. We just have five minutes. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat>
a, a busy day ahead of us. <laughs> Resuming, just going to finish up uh, one of the last slides. Uh, we dove into the general fund positions. There are also a couple of cemented funded positions, and uh, the recommendation from the administration is to fund those. We have no issues with uh, not you know, moving forward with those, and they have the funding to cover it. Um, and moving on, we're going to cover roads, uh, but we're going to do a quick flip-flop. We're going to talk CIPs first and then cover roads right after. So I'm going to see if Karen and Steve, or if Karen's going to handle it, then uh, I'll hand it over here to Karen Gumman from Capital Projects, and uh, we'll get going here. Good morning, Madam Chair, Supervisors, and all. I'm Karen Gumman. I'm your Capital Project Manager. And uh, the task today is to help shape the uh, upcoming fiscal year Capital Project recommended list. I have um, provided, because it is hard to get all the 40 projects on a PowerPoint slide, but I have provided copies of the recommended Capital Project schedule. And in the interest of time, when we get to that section, I'll start to focus on the new requested capital projects that will impact the general fund on those requests. But I welcome all or any questions you have on the projects. This is my same one. Um, just land here for one quick review. We start the capital project request in the preceding December. We work one-on-one -on -one with all the department heads. We visit um, buildings and project sites to assess the feasibility of the construction requests, large and small. We work with directors on their grant requests. Um, we also take a look at our uh, facility condition assessments and the age of our uh, or failing um, mechanical systems. Definitely this year we're focusing on any ADA improvements that can best serve the community and um, capital projects that also serve the greatest need to the community, such as the parks that we've talked about today. Gabe and I work closely throughout the year to balance the incoming requests and facility needs with budget projections. We start this usually by January of this preceding year, and um, we keep in good measure in trying to meet the projects that have the highest priority as close as fit to available funding. One trend that's been a bit challenging this year is that the good news is there is a a large amount of grants opportunity out there but even the grants that come from the state of California we're finding that they have an eight-month construction schedule and balancing that with public contract codes to do public bidding and bringing projects back to the board and a construction deadline that contractors are willing to participate in participate in and bid is proving a bit of a challenge so we're trying to manage that as best we can. Um, the project pipeline, the goal here is the will of the board, we'll prioritize the projects. And if a project doesn't make it from this schedule, we definitely keep the project information close. As new funding becomes available, we can move projects back into the recommended CIP schedule. Um, we could amortize the cost of projects over multi-years, where an example of that is the library the new library grant is clearly a multi-year project, so saving and stewardship would not be an immediate pressure for this fiscal year. Um, lastly, we're also doing a job order contracting system, which will have po positive impacts for schedule and pricing on smaller projects. Contractors right now don't have the appetite to bid and commit resources for projects I'm seeing under 100,000. Um, but our smaller construction needs are just as vital here and for the public services and so our new jock order project think of it as a umbrella contract with a contractor standing by to do projects and and those projects are still presented um, to the board for approval um, it's just a faster way to execute projects 
So I have two documents um, to maybe assist the recommended project. So this is the overall view. We first started with close to 56 project requests, both from um, aging facility needs to department directors to grants on the horizon for a total of $31 million. Working closely with Gabe for many months, um, I have the Excel if you want to highlight them. Uh, not yet. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, we'll get there. Um, this is the high level view, so um, broken down to general fund construction pro projects in progress is roughly about one, 1 1.7 to build out to finish the pro uh, projects. An example of that is the ADA door system for this building and for the boardroom to assist the public in need. Um, the second portion that I'll go over in a bit more detail is the impact to the general fund, the recommended new capital projects. And that came close to about a $3.7 million projection. So what I'm presenting today is over the ideal target of a $4 million um, general fund budget for new projects and there are nine new projects um, for the recommended capital schedule but we could also uh, look throughout the year if there's any other funding sources to offset that or are there any incoming grants we haven't um, discovered yet ARPA funds that are appropriate so hopefully that 5.4 can align closer to the will of the board for or and Gabe's suggestion for about four million dollar project um, budget. The second section is department funded either with grants or impact fees um, that totaled 15 million dollars for roughly about 20 additional projects. The last section is parks and I don't know if uh, Steve you want to talk about that separate but um, there are de definitely um, park grant development funds to address projects and for a total of 4.4. Can I move off the slide? Oh, yes, please. We can come back to it. And you have a paper copy as well. Oops. Sorry. Um, I'm going to quickly switch off. In the Excel. Great. So here you're able to, or the people out in the community or here in the chambers can kind of see this. Perfect. You can zoom in right here. Okay. Okay, since you keep talking, I'll mention something real quick. Yeah, go, please. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Board. Uh, as Karen just mentioned, just real quick, the, the, the numbers that were just previously presented for the park funding, those are all new construction, new design for the Riverview Regional Park or Sunnyside Park and they are separate funding they're already funded and they don't pertain to some of the park projects that um, Karen's going to mention so that's all great thank you for that um, on your worksheet I wanted to highlight the new recommended capital requests that would uh, charge back or impact the general fund projects um, there's nine in total. They're projects number 24 through 32. And for all to see, they are um, the, the emergency services building. The HVAC is probably about seven years past its useful life and is not performing. So these, the phase is in construction. We have quotes. I'm working with legal on the contract, and we should have the um, lowest responsible uh, contractor in there to replace the unit. Um, the jail commercial ice maker machine is also failing. Um, we have facilities teams that go and fix it and they make adjustments, but it is beyond its useful life and it's a critical, um, critical project. Um, we are waiting for positive word on a state library grant for $10 million. Um, the program has a matching grant requirement and that would hit the general fund as I understand it and so since it's a multi-year project the 5 million would encumber 2.5 million to the general fund this first year of 
year one phase construction and it's probably about a two to three year project. The um, following that the um, the current project of the child support having to move from a leased and lost location to our 1131 San Felipe building requires um, minimum construction remodel, but if we get the library grant, it would displace the Department of Education to move to the um, vacant side of where CSS building is. So the three projects, library, child support and the Office of Education construction are connected to each other in phases. So it was necessary to add that estimated 300,000 in tenant improvements and minimal tenant improvements. We're not doing any structural office reconfiguration. It's more HVAC, carpet, paint. Um, the building is in pretty poor shape. Um, uh, moving costs, all of that is included in that Office of Education move. I'm happy to share three park improvement projects. Um, the feedback from the stakeholders have been really valuable. I also had children in sports and utilized parks in other counties and um, I'm still learning the layout of the parks, but already the need for ADA configured bathrooms is one that sits very important with me as well. Um, Historical Park also has the similar ADA bathrooms and roof construction. I believe it's a failing roof, so you don't want to redo bathrooms and then still have the construction compromised, so that's a, a project. And, um, we would go to public bid, hopefully get in a lowest competitive bid under the 250 um, estimate, but that's where the project costs are placing today. Um, there is a need for not only people space, but document space, and the county does not have a dedicated um, storage facility. We are currently renting out spaces um, just like the public would. There's very few available um, storage, uh, even uh, spaces open. And so we are projecting minimal costs to do a secured site with locked, um, they're similar to the, uh, what you call it, the um, like container storage, but they're, they're constructed and formulated for locked entry and security systems and could secure our documents for a reasonable price. And the last project, number 32, again, hitting the general fund um, commitment for this year of recommended project is the regional park field one lighting as well. The regional park or the vets park? Oh, I'm sorry, vets park. Okay, thank you. I just had Mike Chambliss in my mind at the moment. So. <laughs> So I welcome any questions about projects listed here or projects not listed here. Um, time and attention to any other projects that I missed as a recommendation. Oh, Bob, Bob was going. A oh. okay. um, couple quick questions. Um, <clears throat> one just uh, specific, very specific on the de Department of Education relocation. It shows in one column 300,000 and then over and then it shows 250. Is it 250 or is it 300,000? Um, it's 300,000 as a very high level estimate. It could be, it may cross um, a fiscal year, meaning that we're about to do construction on the child support side of that same office suite. We wouldn't go to bid for the Office of Education Improvements until December of January of next year. And so greater than a six month construction would split the <coughs> general fund commitment spend over two years. Okay. So if you see year. that peach highlighted column fiscal year 22-23, um, there's 250,000 that would spend in this fiscal year and the remainder would roll over to 23-24. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So Good. some projection to future saving stewardship to complete the project. Okay. And then you touched on this, but in our uh, county facilities meeting, Supervisor Gonzalez and I, um, you had, um, we're, we're already committed, essentially committed to the rollover projects, and that's 1.7 million, mm -hmm. essentially, um, which uh, is, is significantly down from where it was at one time, I know, but because a couple of those projects got pulled out. Um, mm -hmm. But again, it's four, it's $4 million basically that we have to work with, um, although I sounds like there's maybe a little bit of wriggle uh, room there, but mm -hmm. $4 million, which means that for new projects, we have roughly like $2.3 million left over. Mm -hmm. If we're going to stay in that four million, is 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 that correct? And maybe you can just touch on that because obviously, um, if we're looking at two point three, and and there's the recommended a three point seven, we've got to we've got to cut a few. I understand of these projects. Yeah. So and um, <clears throat> I oh, excuse me one moment. <coughs> I'm not jarred by your question. It's very good. I just had a moment here. Um, if you go back to displaying the um, the screen where I have the 2122 capital improvement projects rolling forward, these are projects that the board has already approved funding and for scheduling and staffing, and we haven't completed these projects. <clears throat> so I added the column of the construction phase. So three are currently in construction or finalizing contracts. Uh, an additional four are in the design phase, so working with con uh, professional services architects to get the documents necessary for the board to review the projects. But some are still in planning, some are in um, still deferred. So my, my recommendation, knowing these projects, is to move forward with the recommended projects and the ones that are in construction from the existing list as the top priorities. And then a project as a um, countywide roof repair project could possibly wait in a phase two mid-year reevaluation. And that I think would come a lot closer to the numbers to meet the resources that Gabe and I have talked about for several months. Okay, I see. So mm -hmm. we'd be pulling some out of that 1.7 on the first page, mm -hmm. and that would allow us to do close to all of them or all of the recommended capital requests on the second page. That would be my instinctive yeah. recommendation okay. to the board. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so I'm wondering if we can do an analysis, or if we haven't already, of, of how many of these projects could potentially qualify for the ARPA funding. Okay. Um, just for me, it's always better to shift over some of this funding toward the to more discretionary use at some point. It just gives us more flexibility. So um, the it looks like the video conferencing, for instance, for $40,000, I think that would qualify as a remote um technology um for that and maybe some of these other areas like security type projects um whether it's the the jail the safety bollard i know that's only twenty five hundred dollars um but just i would like to see that just to make sure that we're we're using arpa and i know the arpa committee will, will have their say as well but to make just my opinion we should be whatever we can use arpa on we should be using arpa on it just makes it just gives us that flexibility um and then um the you mentioned the the library grant so i don't have to ask that um we're still waiting on that so that that 2.5 that's really dependent on a number of factors right as far as um you know i support the the expansion i've made that clear right, but that's right. just we're, we're not necessarily committing to putting 2.5 from the general fund toward the library this year it's we're, we're going to have further conversations was my understanding correct yes about financing and whether the grant comes through and then if it doesn't then we look at the financing the commitment from the general fund would come once the grant is either awarded or not 
If it isn't awarded, then we'll have to essentially figure out a way to tackle the entire project with the general fund or with the COP or something like that. If the grant or if the grant is awarded, then that's when a formal commitment would need to be made from the board. Um, if it, we're going to be doing something like that, I'm thinking we'll have to, you know, have a meeting and bring an item where the board is mm -hmm. set to commit that funding. But on our side, just for planning, just so the board has an idea on what we're putting on the table, is we're putting a placeholder of 2.5 expenses this upcoming year, the remainder of the following years. But overall, the 2.5 is part of the 3.7, just as a tentative placeholder. And then other funding options may come to to fund it and like surprise across Mickey mentioned making sure that if we can address some of these other projects with ARPA funding which is one-time funding some of these projects one-time uh, not reoccurring expenses that that'd be an appropriate uh, thing to do and look at definitely okay great and then I saw the request for the 640,000 if you add up the different amounts for Vets Park um, I had a couple things the one of one of the question then I'll address a point later but do we have what sort of revenue generation do, do and maybe this isn't a question for you maybe this is for Gabe or somebody else what sort of revenue generation do we have at Vets Parks considering so much mm -hmm. use there from groups and whatnot so revenue generation is pretty minimal um, the main and I guess large source of revenue comes from the Verizon Tower that we have out there so the lease and that's about 20,000 or so a year and that like I mentioned, that's the biggest revenue source. There is some additional revenue that comes from the utilization of the, um, the I guess, the camps or, I guess, uh, sites that can be rented out to families when they hold parks. That's the, uh, essentially, the tables right directly in, on the other side of the road by Veterans Park. Um, that funding kind of goes back to the park, but relatively you know minor when but, it comes the, to the groups don't necessarily the teams and i don't uh, know how this dynamic works the, i'm just the interested groups, um the way that the groups function is that essentially they maintain their fields um so if it's you know cutting the grass or just making sure that their fields are you know up to up to up to par and stand and and can meet and aren't you know failing but the greater expense where it comes to the lighting, making sure the parking lot is maintained, that then falls on the county and it's our responsibility. But through uh, the different um, rec leagues, there isn't anything that is then passed back to the county to contribute towards any of those expenses. That's more or less left to the county to, to pay for that. I would be interested to know what other communities do with, you know, this is, and I'm, a, big supporter of the, I mean it's a really valuable asset I'm not necessarily suggesting we should start charging money or anything like that I would just be interested to know what other communities do with this specific because it's a very unique park um, it's a cornerstone of our community it contributes to not only recreation but um, a lot of other just sociological you know just less incidences of crime and kids doing more positive things so I don't want to mm -hmm. I'm not I just would be interested to know how other communities deal with revenue generation with a park like this and and maybe there are opportunities I know I think Supervisor Hernandez has brought up correct me if I'm wrong but just opportunities for businesses and things like that I know the hot dog guy goes out there <laughs> right. um, but um, but yeah I just would be interested to maybe brainstorm on that topic yeah, and, and I point. think something can be structured around some sort of uh, revenue sharing with some of the, if we do do some public private partnership with some of these organizations that there can be some revenue sharing that then gets kicked back to the county and we can throw that money right back into the park whether it's to maintain the parking lot or the lighting or anything so there, there's definitely some areas that we can look at yes just one comment supervisor Hernandez and I are on the vets park commission and so this has been a hot topic and um, also too we did ask at the last meeting that the different organizations come back with how much money they're investing into the park um, with the fields and things like that and um, that's with the intention of showing exactly how much um, they're saving the county potentially too, to to um, maintain that piece of it on their own whereas we would have to do that if they didn't have that piece of it too but I understand where you're coming from Just quick comment, yeah, the, the, there's been conversations about public-private 
partnerships, basically sharing, um, so maybe even uh, amending the use agreements, right, respecting the leagues, but having some other opportunity to address the all the other needs outside of just the park. I mean, the fields themselves, right? There's cost with, uh, I know the CIP element. That's what we're, uh, you know, from my understanding, some of those funds should be going to. Um, the lighting when it comes to the parks themselves because they're old halogen system you know light light bulbs and you know maybe uh using more energy efficient lighting um besides the safety element but but that's kind of been what's been tossed around as far as anything formal we haven't gotten down that road yet can, can i just as long as we're making commentary something i feel strongly about i was going to address it when we if we get into input is that um I feel like what's lacking in our parks, I feel like a sponsorship program would go a long way, a business sponsorship program. Um, Vets Park in particular, I, I, I'd imagine there would be a, you know, a decent number of businesses that would be very, very interested in sponsoring some, however that might work, whether it's sponsoring the actual, we don't want to chain Veterans Park because <laughs> that's pretty touchy, but the, the names of the park you can look, look at, maybe the regional park when we get into that. Um, but Vets Park has so many different, so many different aspects to it. I feel like a few you could you could sponsor certain fields, or I feel like there's something missing there that we're we're not capitalizing on the number of people that are using that park. And I do feel like business sponsorships would make a lot of sense at some point. Thanks. I was, just, I was just going to jump since we're talking about Vets Park. I know there are business. Um, we used to put up a sign or something a little field but I gather that must that money's at least back then it must go to the to to the little league uh, team or something like that so I don't know but I agree with you there got to be some opportunities the other thing um, I, I'm guessing I know the answer to this but does the city contribute at all toward um, maintaining or that's part I was going to say, from my knowledge, no. There are some, um, for example, one of the things that we had talked um, at one point is uh, the city does have some uh, water infrastructure out there, and there were some conversations about potentially having um, hookups. So since a lot of the a lot of the organizations that utilize them are through Hollis Direct and, and some of the other leagues, um, potentially if one of the larger expenses that we have out in the fields is the water to maintain the irrigation of all the fields to keep them you know nice and green um and potentially seeing if we can work something out with that but as far as i'm aware there isn't you know madam chair if i may say a couple comments with this this was you know the vets park many many years ago you know it was uh, voted in by the people and so the i don't know if there was really formulated a, a financial element to that um past measure many years ago so i think i think it'd be good to come back to this board and just share with the board kind of historically what happened with vets park and then come back and, and discuss it a little bit more because i think what really is missing is the financial piece of it mm -hmm. um to keep that park up to date especially since um you know there there is a reservation um as as mentioned earlier there's you know ball teams that are using it and and um you know i know that there is some generation but you know uh, funding but it's not for the county's not generating any money and there's nothing outside within like a district that's pulling money in to keep up with um uh, with the the maintenance and the other things that are, are happening in that park so i think it'd be good to just come back to to present to your board um since you know it is a new board for the most part and i think it'd be good just to, to discuss it yeah well yeah i think I, I would like to hear that and um just like a number of things uh you know i hear um i mean again city county needs to work closer together on a lot of this stuff you know we hear complaints uh from the city about you know certain things uh you know fire or what have you and yet you know the city doesn't apparently contribute towards Vets Park, the library, barely anything. These are all services. What? Homelessness. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, homelessness. <laughs> so that sense, so. I mean, the list is on, yeah, goes, that's a huge one. Yeah, you're right. It goes on and on and on, and I don't want to get on this subject, but nevertheless, it's, you know, there's, the city has a lot more revenue opportunities um, than the county does, and yet they're, you know, they're not, in my mind, 
paying their fair share on many of these areas. So that's a big problem for us as well. Thank you. I don't think it's been asked, but how much of the funds that we get, Gabe, from, because uh, there's the league, you know, the rec department runs the, the some of the leagues out there, um, like the men's adult league, and, and they obviously collect registration fees, and I know they're pretty expensive. Um, so I don't know if any of that funding comes back to the county or to the to the park. That was a question that we actually raised to the, the I guess, the rec leagues or the little leagues to see we can figure out I know at the end of the day they collect all these fees and essentially they put the funding right back into the the members or I guess all the people all the uh, young kids that apply um, but as I'm aware the way that they maintain their fields is through volunteers so where essentially some of the funding goes that they pay whether it goes to their equipment or signing up for tournaments or anything like that that's a better question answered by the, yeah. the, the rec leagues. Um, and then one quick item of clarification, the city does uh, contribute to the maintaining of one field and for the skate park. Um, Which field? Um, I don't know. Is it the Vets Large? I don't know exactly which one, but we have a contract with the city. Because um, I, I believe it's the Vets Large, and I can tell you as a, someone who's played on that field, yeah, there, you can break your ankle out there easily because of all the, the um, rodents and the holes out there. Mm -hmm. So it hasn't been well maintained, right? There's no standard is what I'm hearing basically to this process. Well, I, I don't want to continue capping on the, the city and what they aren't, aren't doing because then we'll be no better than them when they make allegations toward the county. Um, but we, I, I do know that there has been public comment submitted and two individuals who actually participate in Vets Park. Um, I Madam, that Madam Chair, just yes. to be clear, I, 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 I'm not making allegations. I'm saying what's true as not just a player, but someone who's talked yeah, to I, the rec department that. director. Yeah. Madam Chair, can we get, I don't know, in light of timing, because I know we're probably going to work through lunch. Can we maybe move the presentation and then ask for public okay. comment? We'll get through the through the presentation. I know Steve has an element to the presentation, the road piece. So, all right, Karen, do you want to? I'd be glad to take questions. Well, we'll defer those till after. So, Steve, I think mm -hmm. uh, we have you up next. Okay. Just just to conclude on the worksheet, um, I've. You have a larger copy of the total summary for all the projects. And we do work closely with all of the department directors for their identified needs. So on the report, I do have the black line end of report, but definitely these project requests can be on standby if there's some other budget opportunities that come up mid-year. We are. We have the project information on a just a light high level and we'd be glad to revisit the will of the board for remaining projects And then before you step away from the podium So if we're looking at the the legal sized um, Excel sheet that you gave us mm -hmm. um, on page one the schedule to roll forward all the items under that um, have already been approved at one point and are moving forward is, am I correct in saying that? Yes. And then, so then page two, um, the yellow area where you have the new recommended capital requests, um, those would account for the total amount in the 3.7, correct? And you said that was an additional 2.3 was already budgeted? Was Yes, approved by the board, yes. Okay. So so we can assure that those projects on that in that section of the spreadsheet are moving forward. Yes, and they are moving forward as of today in different um, different speeds, different phases, just from balancing our time and resources. So if it's the will of the board to put a project either number one through 17 on a less priority um, placement on a construction go schedule, that could help balance um, capital improvement budgets. Okay. And the roof, uh, countywide roof impairment project might be a good example of that decision or recommendation to the board. Okay. And then we'll also focus on ARPA money. We'll take that back to the yes. ARPA uh, ad hoc, and then we'll, we'll go through that uh, and make sure, you know, 
and to address Supervisor Kosmicki's concerns, um, we have been looking as many of these as, as possible to allocate toward ARP funds. Um, and so we, we have been mindful of that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. So just for clarification, do we have to make any, you have enough direction, do we have to make I think we got direction. As here? long as there's not, no, I know one or the board's not opposed to what the staff's recommendation is with those, okay. with those tweaks, I think we got clear, we got pretty good direction. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Steve. So are we deviating away from the parks or um, still on I know we're on capital improvements project still but yeah. we can we can wait to hear the comments at the very end if that's okay with your board I just um, okay yeah. oh, thank you the pages are getting bigger and bigger <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So if the board is ready to continue to move on, the next presenter that we have here is uh, Steve Loop, our interim uh, or assistant director of public works and engineering, and for a time also our interim director of RMA. He's going to be going over our road infrastructure projects, um, and I believe he had handed out uh, essentially large pieces of paper, which are the projects that we're going to be discussing today. Um, and uh, I'll hand it over here to Steve, so let's kick it off. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair and, and Board of Supervisors. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, roads and bridges for this part of the presentation. And um, they'll essentially be broken into two categories. One is a capital improvement program, and those are essentially projects that have been um, previously approved, at least in previous years, um, and have funding allocated to them, whether that's Measure G or the Highway Bridge Program or SB1. Um, so I'll go through that list um, a little quicker than the second list, which um, pertains to general fund, COP, benefit fee um, funding that's um, Gabe and his team and Ray have been working on to actually enhance and, um, and uh, speed up the process to have additional um, projects implemented for the county. So um, on the board, um, the thing that um, some of the supervisors might already be aware of, but the Highway Bridge Program is essentially, it's 88% funded by the state and the federal government. So um, the projects listed there uh, are in various states. They're all actually um, should be built or started construction within the next um, two to three years. And um, the ones I've highlighted, uh, the three in green, will actually be in construction uh, next year, either in the spring or the summer. Um, so one of them is Lime Kiln Road Bridge, one of them is Union Road Bridge, which is at the intersection of San Benito Street and Union Road near the high school. We're kind of flattening out that curve. And um, the third uh, bridge is uh, Rocks Road, kind of a small bridge um, that's supposed to begin construction uh, next summer. And so um, we're not asking for much input from the board at this time on those projects, but um, they are a very important part of our overall program. And so we'll be talking about a couple other bridges that are locally funded um, in just a moment. Uh, regarding FHWA, there are um, some emergency repairs of uh, Cienega Road that we're working on that we actually have funding for as well. And those are on um, items 10 and 11. New Idria, we have started the design of that um, washout project. It's going to be a new either box culvert or bridge repair. And um, the California Department of um, Operations and Emergency Services is actually help helping to fund the majority of that project. So it will cost approximately $2.4 million, um, but we are fairly confident that most of that is actually getting reimbursed by the state of California. So that's very good news as well. So then we go down to Measure G. Um, all of our 
residents and voters uh, pass the sales tax, and it's been very helpful for our program. We've just completed the Southside Road project, 5,000 block, which is adjacent to Southside School. Uh, so that project is completed. And if, if you um, please turn your attention for this discussion, mostly for fiscal year 22-23, the projects that are going to be implemented are a couple of projects for Cienega Road, also the same kind of um, roadside washout area. Um, and additionally, with those funds, we're going to be, we've already started the Car Ave Bridge Replacement Project, which I've highlighted in light green because our hope is to start that late next year. Um, we have to get th through some environmental process. And so when you see the 675000 for fiscal year 22-23, um, some of that is for design, and then some of it is actually going to begin construction, fingers crossed, and then it'll, um, construction will spill over into uh, 22, 23 and 24. Uh, the other local, a locally funded bridge project is Cienega, the Cienega Bridge near Berg Creek. It's, it's near um, Halster Hills, uh, about a mile away, maybe less. And that's also a locally funded project. And the reason why those are locally funded is because they don't qualify for the highway bridge program. Uh, they're both slightly under 20 feet in length. When we rebuild them, they'll be exceeding 20 feet in length, and then we'll apply them to be part of the highway bridge program. So if they need to be replaced in 30, 40 years, um, then hopefully the state and federal government will help them um, actually fund that replacement. But those are locally funded. Another project that we've started this year is at the intersection of San Benito Street and um, uh, River Parkway, essentially. And um, we're gonna be looking at probably doing signal, but perhaps a roundabout that location. It's near the school, there's a stop sign there today. It's getting a little crowded and um, just for safety reasons, um, we've started to look at the design to improve that intersection so that it won't just be stop controlled, either be a signal or a roundabout. And then as we go to the SB1 projects, and I'll tell you what, I'll, Excuse I'll me. pause there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Madam Chair, yes. quick question, Steve. Yes, sir. So when we look at this, um, as we look at going across, we see the amounts in each year. So that kind of tells us where you're allocating the money. Am I right in thinking if I see something that goes to, let's say, 2025, 26, that's when, and that's where the last, amount of money is that's where you expect the project to be completed is that kind of the way we we can evaluate this that's correct and um, very good question supervisor Tiffany the, the the projects that spill over into further years um, they will either not be able to be funded in that year with a allocated budget or we just don't think they'll um, be able to be constructed in that year and so um, most likely, though, it's, it's based on a, a funding mechanism when they, they spill over into kind of the future years. Um, so if that does so, answer your So question. in some cases, it may be completed before then, but we're actually um, paying for it in future years to a certain extent? Or am I, is that right? To some extent, yes. Especially with SB1, you'll see in a moment, um, that funding source uh, is from the state and for example, we have a carryover, I believe, of 2.5 million from previous years. And so, like, for example, this year, um, I'll show you in a moment, uh, that funding usage is going to be exceeded um, this next fiscal year. But because we had funds that we had not used in prior years, it spills over. So um, I'm not sure the answer is. Okay, the question. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So. On that note, we will come down to SB1 and talk about, discuss a view of the projects that are occurring under that funding mechanism. It's state-funded program. So currently, we've um, selected a contractor with the board's approval for um, five different segments. Some are in uh, Aromas, and a few are, a lot of the segments are uh, along Cienega Road. And those have started in fiscal year 21, 22, but they're actually primarily going to be completed during 22 and 23. And um, as I mentioned, if you look down below, you'll see the available budget. We get, just for uh, supervisor's information, we get are receiving approximately $2 million a year with the SB1 program. But some of it carries over from previous years, and we're going to be 
essentially, uh, I'll say almost zeroing out during fiscal year 22-23, where we had approximately 2.5 million that was carried over and added to what was not spent last year. We have about 5.6 available for that program. And so if you look down below at the total, you'll see 5.7 million and 3.1 as a, a funding available. Um, and uh, just to not confuse things, we didn't, because we're not showing fiscal year 2020 and 2021, we didn't put that in there, but technically the funding available is actually 5.6 million. So, and one, um, another item that I wanted to mention for SB1 specifically is that um, Shore Road is a priority for the project. If you look at um, item number 15 in row 42, uh, Shore Road, uh, Highway 25 to um, San Felipe Road, um, it, it's that cost is spread over various segments in various years. And so, for example, in SB1, we will have be kind of finishing up some of the funding. If you look at fiscal year 24 and 25, but when we go to the the last category, the the optional funds, I'll say that are going to be a little more at the discretion of the board and and some decisions will have to be made. Um, there's some funding for Shore Road in that last group that we'll be discussing in a few minutes, but uh, some of it actually is allocated for SB1. It's just not quite enough. But um, so I just wanted to bring that up for further discussions about Shore Road. And then additionally, um, Fairview Road, there's been some expression by the supervisors to focus on Fairview Road because it, it needs attention. And so um, it's also going to be found in a few different locations for improvements to Fairview Road. So if you look at row 31 or item 31, um, cold in place recycling Santana Ranch to 200 feet south of the Santana Creek Bridge. So the Santana Ranch project is going to be improving its frontage, but from that location towards the Creek Bridge to within about 200 feet, we're going to be replacing that um, segment of payment with SB1 funds this year. and. The reason why we're stopping at the 200 feet from the bridge is because the bridge project itself is a, a bigger, maybe three, $4 million project that we're gonna have to um, hopefully implement in the future and use some funding there. But um, we're gonna get close to both sides of the bridge um, during the next few years. So we also have a, just on that related note, we have a larger drainage study that's actually looking for, at the drainage and examining the drainage for that entire drainage basin and once we have that study completed, hopefully by the end of next year, then we'll have a better idea of what that bridge design will look like and also perhaps some additional piping that will um, be needed to be installed under Fairview Road. And we will obviously not improve the road if we're putting a pipe underneath it, but um, we'll, the study will be uh, kind of coinciding with that effort. So, all right, let's see. And we'll head down to Enterprise Fund. So um, there's a little bit of revision in the Enterprise Fund. We thought we were going to utilize most of the funds this year that we had available. We did not. We actually have a bit left over. The Enterprise Fund is generated by um, John Smith Landfill funding. And we were able to complete Best Road and Fairview Road this year, some pretty large segments, mm -hmm. all Best Road and a good portion of Fairview. And we still have approximately um, about a million dollars remaining, maybe a little bit more. Uh, so we're going to spend 900000 of that on another segment of Fairview Road from Orchard to Los Viboris. Um, I probably pronounced that wrong. It's over near um, 156. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and um, so that's a segment with, that we're going to improve with the extra funding that we have available from the Enterprise Funds. So that's a bit of good news. And traffic impact fees. So we need to, traffic impact fees um, are fees that are collected with, with development primarily through development funds. And one of the things about the traffic impact program is we have, <laughs> technically we have about $12 million in that fund, um, but that comes with a caveat. And traffic impact fees are designated for very specific purposes. A lot of the funding um, is being accumulated to make Fairview Road a four-lane road, to make Union Road a four-lane road, and those funds have to be utilized for those purposes. 
Um, even though Union and Fairview are in their two-lane state they have a lot of issues, we can't just use the funds to uh, remediate and replace the two interior lanes um, unless we're also widening. We can come over a bit into the lanes, not, but the, the main two lanes that are there, we can't use the traffic impact fee funds for. That's just the way the program is implemented. Essentially, what the funds are collected because new residents and users are being added to the roads, and therefore the program says, okay, because those new users, we need to add new lanes. And so that's what the funds um, are dedicated for, for better or for worse. Um, so we will use them at some point in the future. However, a good use of the funds that's in the traffic program, there are some intersections. And one of the supervisor's previous requests um, was to accelerate the Fairview Road, Fallon Road intersection improvements because we have some, um, they just need to be improved, I'll say that. And so we looked at the traffic impact fund account and that funding is available for that project. So on um, line 65 or the bottom line of the traffic impact fees, we've placed per supervisor directions previously about a month or two ago to have the Fairview Road, Fallon Road intersection accelerated to be um, designed and constructed during the next fiscal year. Wow. And um, that brings me to a, a, a little point where we have five consultants that work on our designs and um, some of them are very large consulting firms and so we're hoping that you know these projects can be implemented per those consultant teams that we have available. We think it is possible, um, but we're, we're being ambitious. So it's possible some of these would get started in design and maybe not be completed, for example, Fairroof Island this year, but we will try very hard to make that happen. So um, I can stop there, or actually, it might make sense. Let me talk just a bit about the um, RSTIP program and some items there, and then we can talk about the, the optional potential funding. So again, um, New Idria item 12, first um, RSTIP program, we're actually in the design phase. We, the state has basically said we're going to reimburse you even for the design so that that 470,000 hopefully will be reimbursed to us, but we have to spend it up front first. Um, it's a pay after the project is complete type of program for that, so we have to place it in our budget. Um, and then another intersection that was added to start um, be accelerated essentially was uh, the Fairview Quista Pace Comstock intersection because that intersection also has some safety issues. It's the one just north of Fallon along Fairview Road and um, kind of near Spring Grove School. And so we've, we're gonna start the design of that intersection this year and the construction will probably go into next year. In addition to that, we have a lot of striping areas that roads, um, for various reasons, the striping's disappearing. So we have a project to work on approximately six road segments and just redo the striping essentially for those. It won't be, it'll be a very basic surface treatment and just new striping. We also have been requested to uh, look at speed bumps throughout various roads in the county, so we've allocated some funding for that. And we're actually working with the city of Hollister to expedite that. It's, it's approximately 3,000 per location for the speed bumps, um, times two if it's two ways, it's six. Anyways, um, we've allocated approximately 400,000 for that effort. And then there's some ADA and sidewalk improvements kind of sprinkled throughout the county that the jock program will be very helpful towards implementing and we've allocated a little over half a million for that and finally um, Shore Road another small piece of that is here as well on the RSTIP program um, 250,000 one thing to mention and Karen mentioned a little bit before was the jock program once these program once these projects are um, approved by the supervisors and the decisions are made over the next month up until I believe July 1st um, any of the projects on this list or Karen's list could theoretically be um, awarded to the, the jock contractors. Now they have a limited budget, but um, and I think it's, we're gonna go with $3 million initially for each contractor. However, you know, 
once the project is designed essentially, then we can just pick one of those three contractors that have been chosen with the jock program that is actually going to be you know upcoming with the board of supervisors. We're going to talk more about that at a, a, a I think it's next week's board of supervisor meeting actually. Yeah, next meeting. Yep, and um, so it's it's good news. So we'll have contractors on board ready to build projects, and they can spend up to three million dollars initially, and any of the projects that have been approved by the board at, the, at that time, we can award to one of those. The, the one of those contractors and, and the, the fees are set and they just have essentially a profit margin that they place on there's thousands of items whether it's a roof or some asphalt or whatever it might be the way the jock program works is the contractor just adds a percentage of profit and then all the other prices are fixed so it's a pretty nifty program all right uh, CSAs we have a couple projects coming up in 2023 we have a pipe replacement at um, Lemon Acres and a few things at um, Santana Ranch. So I probably should rename this to CSA slash CFD. So I will do that. Those are self-funded by the CSAs and the CFDs. Uh, drainage impact fee fund. I mentioned previously, we actually started a study for um, the storm drain of Fairview Road, Santana Ranch, Santana Creek. We started a global drainage study for the area this year and Hope to wrap it up early next year to kind of just assess some of the, the flooding issues we've been experiencing along, specifically on Fairview Road south of the bridge and um, near the mobile home park and just north of Santana Ranch. So we're actually working on a global storm drain study to um, just assess the situation. Um, and then there's a... Okay, hold on, we have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, it's specific to this because when before Mike Shambliss left, he and I had a big conversation because the big rain we had in January, we were the four, the three of us were out there, and we were at the mobile home park and we were checking it out and and everything. So he said that the city um, at the right before he left, he said the city was willing to work with us on that. Is that still the case? It is. So okay. Um, the first phase is and we've told the consultant this, we're gonna analyze the county area, but I actually told the consultant, directed the consultant, I should say, that um, once we get a handle on our area, then we're gonna bring in the city because downstream of San, along the creek, um, near, well, yes, downstream essentially, there's some constraints that the city has. So we're gonna combine you know, our initial results to see where we're at and then bring the city on board. So that's correct, Supervisor Dirks. And that money is already set aside, correct? It is. There's actually a drainage impact fund set aside, and um, we have sufficient funds uh, for that study. So, yeah. thank you. Um, this year, we're trying not to use <laughs> general fund county fees as much as possible because of some of the previous issues that we've already discussed. So, we're not requesting any general fund fees for the the roads or the bridges at this time. Um, we do have a, a barrier rail replacement project. We actually hope to. I believe there's 21 guardrails throughout the county. We've already received the grant, so we should be installing those this year. And now we come to the general fund benefit fees, COP um, area. And um, this is where we are requesting supervisors input, please. So we previously presented, I believe it was $28 million of funding in this category and um, working with Gabe and, and, and Ray's office, um, we're fairly confident that this year we'll have approximately $12 million um, to utilize uh, for those type of projects. And this could come from, from various sources, but um, we're fairly confident based on recent conversations that at least $12 million will be available. And whether that is spread over this year or the next few years, um, out of that 28 million, there's a lot of funding options, but what I guess my, I'm trying to highlight is that the $12 million, $12 million up front, those are funds that if supervisors want to prioritize or shuffle around versus um, 23, 24 and in, in future years, um, we're fairly certain that we have 12 million now to work with. So we've placed what are essentially the these are all previous supervisor priorities, essentially, but out of that 28 million, we placed what we think are maybe higher priorities on the 12 million, noting that the future years that show the 10.6 and 
the 1.6 and the 4, um, those are maybes, I guess is a way to put it, potential funding sources, whereas we're fairly confident that at least at, the, at a minimum we have approximately 12 million to work with to accelerate roadway projects as the supervisors have um, asked us to do. So I'll just go through the list real quick that we've chosen for, um, for that initial 12 million. The first one is uh, San Juan Canyon Road. It's approximately seven millions. It's first six miles of roadway and um, we hope that you know project goes forward. It's definitely needed. And then we jump down to uh, New Adrian Pinot Road. We previously discussed between two and three million for that project to address some very large potholes in South County. So we wanted to place that in the, in the initial 12 million. Um, Cienega Road, just a small stretch, about a half mile adjacent to the wineries, but it is a, an area where the you know, tourist and revenue and, and that type of thing is important. So we placed that within the 12 million. And then the last one was in Tres Pinos. Um, Tres Pinos has got you know, a lot of potential, a lot of um, tourist activity and resident activity, and it's, you know, it's a great place. And so their roads need some attention. So you can pretty much repave all the roads around Tres Pinos for approximately a million dollars, maybe 1.1 million. So that's the 12 million. Um, I'll talk about the other ones as well. And then if the supervisors want to provide us direction into, and whether it's today or in the next presentation, but um, you know, again, the, the, it's the 12 million that we're we're fairly certain we're going to have, and and so let's see if I can scroll over just a bit. We'll see. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, here we go. Okay, so um, not as secure funds, but uh, we're hopeful in the years 2023, 20, 24, the projects that we place there, uh, Sealy Avenue. Uh, it's just a half a mile road uh, near Carpeteria, Buena Vista Road. It's also roughly half a mile. I think it's a little bit more, yeah, 0.6 miles. Uh, Union Road um, from 156 to essentially well, about three miles towards town. Um, and that, again, is the two lanes that are existing today and need to be rehabilitated. And... Um, Shore Road, we're giving some additional money as uh, so we've been sprinkling it throughout various projects and funds. And on that note, you know, Shore Road with the other funding will have funding. It's just a matter of how far we can, you know, rebuild Shore Road. Um, but to really build it out, we need that 1.5 million. It might even be a little bit more later. But and then finally, um, we're hopeful teaming with San Juan Batista. There's four or five segments. Uh, I won't name them now, Prescott and San Justo and, and three other roadways where San Juan Batista is actually building a force main project and we're hoping to team with them and repave. They're going to repave one lane and we'd like to repave the other lane. And of the 23-24 funding of that 10.6 million, um, our staff would recommend that that 4 million be prioritized because we really do want to pave those roads when that project happens. And if it starts in even at the end of next year, which is possible, you know, we might have to have another discussion with the board and see if they want to team with that project at that time, because it makes a lot of sense. They're, they're going to be, you know, essentially uh, removing and replacing one side of five long stretch or six long stretches of roadways from San Juan Batista all the way to the new or uh, city's wastewater treatment plant. And so we very much recommend that that four million um, be allocated towards that project when it occurs. And going a little farther out in the future, let's see. Start up top. Okay. So I think yeah. So the the next project. In 24-25 is uh, Fraser Lake, 1.8 miles beyond Shore Road. So um, one thing to note, and I don't want to over, overlook this, um, at the intersection of Fraser Lake and Shore Road, we working with a consultant on a local highway safety program, local roadway safety program, and we're fairly confident that we will get a grant to improve the intersection of Shore Road and Fraser Road 
for, through the HSIP program. Therefore, that intersection does not show up anywhere in the CIP. It's, we haven't even applied for it yet, um, but we're, we're hoping to get there. And uh, the grant process is opening, and um, you know, we're, we're fairly confident through all our intersections of applications of things we could apply for that, that Fraser Lake and Shore Road, if we're going to get a grant for safety improvements, that will be the intersection. So we're, we're hopeful of that. So fingers crossed. Um, Question for you on that one. You so bet. is that why you've pushed it off to the 23-24 um, fiscal year? And the reason I ask is if anyone who drives the back roads of, of, um, from Hollister to Gilroy, those roads are atrocious. Um, and I understand that we're looking at priority and so forth, but we are a bedroom community. And if you just sit on the side of that road and just see the volumes of traffic, you know, I don't even bother going to Gilroy um, in, in the afternoon hours because it's just the volume that's coming in. Um, but 23, 24 is a significant time to wait. But are you waiting for it because you anticipate those additional funds to, to materialize? Is, is that your logic? Um, partially, and that's a really great question. So this would be the roadway segments essentially from that intersection towards um, Gilroy mm -hmm. and the grant itself for the intersection would be another probably 1.3 1.4 million it's it's a separate project but it would just be for the intersection so if the supervisor so directed us the the actual roadway segment of Fraser itself Fraser Lake you might want to shuffle that into an earlier time frame than the 2425 um, well I'm, I'm not questioning I'm just that was just was asking you know for, for the logic's sake you know because you have the numbers you know the information you know the funding that's coming toward us that, that we don't know until you give us that information and and again we have a huge population that are commuting in and out and it's not supposed to be a main artery but that's what it's become no it, it's a great question yeah and probably to make it a, a little clearer because I think we're on the same page but that safety project is just for the intersection. Right. And we're hopeful that we'll get funding for that intersection improvements. The 1.6 million that's down here for Fraser Lake, that's that would be a separate project essentially, and that's a project that takes us to where the pavement becomes you know in a decent condition about two miles beyond Shore Road. So therefore, if the supervisors thought it was more of a priority and wanted to move that over towards fiscal year 22, 23, or 23, 24, an earlier year, then, um, you know, please let us know. So, Madam if, Chair, if can works. I make a suggestion? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because I had a similar, so I'm looking at San Juan Canyon, obviously um, Supervisor Tiffany and I both supported that. I still strongly support that, but I'm wondering if there's a way to perhaps split that up because it's gonna take a while um, and maybe do you know, like half of it, just plan for like half of it in 22, 23, and maybe the other half in 23, 24, which would allow you to bump up Shore Road, Fraser Lake Road, Fraser Lake, um, and then the 1.8, the 1.5 and the 1.55. And then I would just suggest throwing in um, Sealy Avenue and or Buena Vista to fill out the the three point f if this is assuming you split it right in half it's three point four um that would bring that would give you um the the two shore road projects would give you about three a little over three and then if you throw in Sealy, for instance that puts you right at about half of the you know the six point eight it's just a thought i don't know how logistically that might work but it might because you know san juan canyon's a really valuable road it leads to a state park i still think the state should be paying part of this and i still do would like us to at least reach out um, to our reps. Maybe our advocate can do that. Um, I just, I, even when I brought it up uh, with the local farmer, we we're just talking about Bixby and then mentioned, hey, we're going to be doing San Juan Canyon. He kind of looked at me like, hey, shouldn't the state be paying for some of that? And I, we've all said that. So I, it's not just here. I, I think that's just a logical thing. But I would just, that's, that's something that I had in my notes is could we do that? Could we split up San Juan Canyon, which would allow us to, um, to start to start on some of these other projects a little earlier. Absolutely, and that's the kind of direction that um, we're looking for. So the answer is absolutely, and I'll do that and other and you know incorporate other input um, as well here, so that the next time you see this chart, I'll we'll make that adjustment. So. Can I 
please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Kotsmicki, um, for, for suggesting that because that was something I was looking at and too. Supervisor Gonzalez, obviously that's in my district and it would be nice if it kind of coincided. I was looking at the timeline of all the other road improvements with Fairview. Um, because I think then, you know, everyone moving through through that area, it would you wouldn't be going from one terrible, terrible road to a brand new one. Sometimes it highlights, um, you know, the di discrepancy in the, the road there. So um, in any case, I do think that not just for that piece of it, but I think it would be great if we could do that because it, the traffic's going to continue um, to, you know, be heavier as Santana Ranch builds out and, and Roberts Ranch, I would assume as well. And so um, I think if we can provide that little bit of extra quality of life for people and their cars, I think that would be to to our benefit. I would support it. Sounds good, yeah. thank you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in as well. Yeah, I think uh, just big picture, I think we as a board maybe need to, uh, and I think we're kind of on the same page, but there's certain roads that should be the priority. And um, in my mind, Fairview is one of them for sure. And, and as Supervisor Dirks just said, I don't think it makes sense. I mean, I have people ask me, why did you just do this section and didn't do that section? And I wonder that myself. But at any rate, I know, you, you know it's how we lay out the money, but I mean, Fairview, because it's such a major road and it also, Let's face it, there's a lot of, um, it's a hot issue because of the landfill. So politically, it's a big road. So anyway, to me, I would try to figure out a way to get Fairview done, all of, you know, all of it, as soon as possible, that number one. I would also, personally, I would like to see Union Road completed as soon as possible. Maybe not quite as high a priority as Fairview, but it's still a high priority. The stretch, um, and I, I agree with Supervisor Kosmicki. I mean, it, we share this in our district, but to me, San Juan Canyon, yes, it needs to be done. But in terms of traffic and, and usage, it's not nearly as a high priority as those two roads I just mentioned, for example. Um, uh, you know, for me, at least for my district, um, I guess the other one that I see that uh, is Sienega from Mudstone Ranch to Bird Creek. And I know you can't do them all, but anyway, I'm just throwing this out there. Uh, that is a major road that tourists use to go to the wineries, and it's a very, it's a pretty dangerous road going over the top. Um, you know, it's in terrible condition. So anyway, that's the other one. But, but anyway, I, I know we can't, you can't do them all all at once. Um, one last thing, this is just a very specific thing. Um, I, you caught my eye when you had the barriers there. If you would make a note, there is a, there is a place on Quien Sabe Road, quite a ways up there. And it, again, now this is not used that much, I realize, but it's a very dangerous curve. And people have gone off the edge and been killed. Uh, I think there's been one fatal accident. When I raised the issue on it, I was told, well, you have to have so many fatalities before you can actually put in a barrier, which doesn't, I mean, I can't believe that's really true. Um, so anyway, the point is, I would maybe you and I can talk separately, but it would be great if we could get a barrier. I've been requested about that on this one section of King Sabe. Um, yep. If it's not already in, the, in the, the barrier amount you have. I, I will I will look supervisor and, and see if um, it's one of the barriers on that road if it's those are barrier replacements um, for yeah, the this for is the not a and replacement this, and this so is a new I, I you know I, I know there's I don't know well and, and to answer your question if, if it was a Caltrans project they have very specific criteria about guardrail installation but on a local road we have some flexibility for key and yeah. anyway we can yeah. but we can talk about that talk offline, about that yes please uh, but anyway my like I said my general comment I think there's certain roads in our community, whichever district they're in, I don't really care that we should try to deal with because those are the most traveled, they're potentially the biggest safety issue, um, mm -hmm. and those are gonna be the ones that will, you know, people are gonna see and have the biggest, you know, positive impression if we actually, you know, get them done. So I'd like to 
have those prioritized. Thank you. Yeah, we'll definitely make those adjustments. Um, just a, a little bit of um, maybe background or context is we, we probably don't want to, let's just say we had 15 million to finish Fairview and Shore Road. I'm not sure we'd want to complete all that, that entire segment at the same time because traffic would be pretty horrendous going down to one lane traffic. So we try to keep some of those things in consideration when we, um, when we but we'll definitely shift um, the, Key and, or the San Juan Canyon Road, some of that funding, approximately half. Or can I, I was actually going to, after Supervisor Tiffany, is it worth just pushing San Juan Canyon? It's in my district, so I'm going on a limb here. Um, <laughs> pushing San Juan Canyon off a full year and pushing Union Road up a full year and then working from there with some of these other, the Shore Road can be still because it's four million dollars you have 6.9 basically to work with i was saying i was saying the same yeah. thing i didn't want to speak no 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 I'm, but but no i i think that 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 kind of approach makes sense to me um for sure and um we can do so that. it's still going to be addressed it's just right. not going to right just yeah. not in the next year yeah 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 absolutely thank you sounds good great ideas and you know i have to say and this is the way it's going to work, Steve. People will complain about the roads being in terrible shape, but as soon as you stop traffic, then they're going to be complaining about that <laughs> while we're fixing them. That's correct. So. I have concerns about our the road crews building those roads um, based on some fair view and best road close calls. So anybody listening, please drive slowly through construction zones, please. So thank you. <laughs> okay, those are great suggestions. And... Um, Think we're, I think we're. I think we're good. I, I had a couple of other real quick questions. I'm sorry. I, okay. We had the conversation going, but um, San Juan Highway was taken off. Is that just? So, oh, great question. Um, San Juan Highway, because there's a lot of funding grant sources when you have bike lanes and schools involved. Oh, yeah. That's why we um, removed that. So, thank you. I forgot to mention that, but um, that was one of the decisions for that. If yeah, if, if that could really be a priority with that grant, we get hopefully a grant writer. I, San Juan Highway is in rough shape, and um, especially I, I agree that that makes a lot of sense. The bicycling, mm -hmm. um, and then the mentioning of the barriers. We had that gentleman come in last meeting about Buena Vista twenty four twenty Buena Vista, at least examining, looking if that is worth. I don't know if it is or not, but he had that concern about traffic zipping around there and seeing if that might be an area for one of those as well yeah and i'll make a note and that was that it would be part of our speed attenuation project but i'll make sure that we because he was concerned about speeds around the area yeah and then two correct. last points um the pio when we get a pio it'd be nice to really have this be an emphasis of theirs just you know promoting the road work we're doing and the schedules and all that and then um lastly uh the the rural roads um tough conversation that I think we have to have at some point as far as how do we mitigate farm traffic and the impact that large farm vehicles have on the roads and not to you know penalize them but to, to work with our farmers to do a better job of, of preventing some of the serious damage that's done to, to some of these roads. Bixby's on the list. I don't want us to go and fix Bixby and then have it two years later the thing is torn up again. Um, so anyhow just a thought. Thank you. That's a great point. And one thing we could do in, in um, Abraham, our assistant plan director is here, but we can work with planning staff when we, at least when we approve, there's a lot of farmers doing um, new projects, whether it's storage, barns, and various, various projects going on. So one of the things I think we should start requiring is that at the very least, they just put a basic fence along their property line, because a lot of them don't. And then part of the problem you addressed or you, you noted is the, the there's cross traffic and there's farmers that actually come into our lanes and make a U-turn and go back onto their property. So we'll try to maybe implement some fencing. Won't make farmers happy, but it'll be on our property. Um, but yeah, it's it's worth noting. So yeah. thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. We're almost done. Uh, we have um, just a couple more items, um, and then after that, man, I'm sure you can go to public comment. So I'll go to page 17 on your PowerPoint. Uh, with regards to the public defender, this is out of County Council's office. Uh, this was brought to our attention. We currently have a, a contract for Gerald Alvarez Kuma Level One. That's a three-year contract with a 1.5 percent increase uh, for the first year and a 1.5 percent percentage increase for the second year. We have two other contracts, Level Two and Three. And do you, I don't know if you want to talk to it. I can talk to it. But basic, you want to talk to it, or I can talk to it. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Barbara. Okay, so um, 
this and I don't know we're, we're talking relatively small dollar amounts right now so I don't know whether the board wants to consider this or to appoint two board members to to work out the details the I can go into the count the we received a proposal for two two percent and two percent and then the county uh, suggested and this is, of course is subject to the board's approval coming back at a future board meeting 1.5 percent and 1.5 percent in May of 2021 and May of 2022 the counter was uh, three percent um, on May of 2021 which would be coming to the board at the next meeting hopefully um, but that was going to be presented to the board because that's um, up front um, which would be equivalent to the 1.5 1.5 that's being granted to Fitzgerald Chumo firm except it's all at one time instead of um, broken over two different years um, in order to be more consistent with the prior contract that was done in 2020 late 2020 or early 2021 which um, uh, which had their kind of their um, increases set at a different time frame I'm I'm suggesting that perhaps we counter with the 3% at um, May of 2022, I'm sorry, October 2022. But if I could have two, maybe two board members to go over the details of that, or we can discuss it now, it's at your pleasure. Tiffany, excuse me, Supervisor Hernandez and I were on the, the contract in order to, to pull these in. Can we just go ahead and delegate it back to, to that? Or than, can we agree here? Because I think 1.5 is fine to me. I mean, is it the 1.5 um, for one thing, year and the 1.5 for the, I mean, for the second year? Considering that, inflation, that seems like a pretty darn good deal to me. Is that what you're suggesting? The yeah. 1.5 for, this for, year and then 1.5 next year? For both, for, for Damcar and Brown, for both. Mm -hmm. Because up, my understanding is Damcar wants a 3% for the first year and zero in the second year. So. And, and it also, to Barbara, can you address and, the. Yeah, and the time you want me to go into? Yes, please. Okay. And then in light of the uh, kind of a review of the contract, we noticed that um, the law firm is billing at the, the rates of 2019. The contract that was entered into um, had tied their COLAs um, to the percent COLA granted to the MEG unit. And the MEG unit received a 3% a in 2021, which they're not billing yet. So basically, um, it doesn't it, now. We, it doesn't um, really. They should not probably receive another 1.5 percent on top of the three percent that they already received. That's why we're suggesting that it be pushed out until October, because um, then it's going to be a 4.5 percent within the, the six months. But give them the cola that they had not billed for. The cola, that, and, yeah, and give them what they were owed, basically. Yeah. And then, um, so it's it's up to the board. You can that there's that three percent that they could bill for that that was supposed to go into place in ten twenty one, and then uh, in order to make them consistent with Fitzgerald, it would be one point five percent and then one point five percent. But since they just got a three percent, it seems like the cola should be pushed off into uh, further into the future, perhaps October twenty twenty two. That, that sounds agreeable to me. I'll push it off till 2022, but give them what they're entitled to, what they had not billed for. Yeah. We, we okay with that with the whole board? I'm fine with that. Yeah. Okay, good. So okay. we got a direction. Good deal. Thanks. So we're going to come to the next meeting. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, that was it for the public defender. The next two slides are relatively quick. Um, we have a resolution uh, to go along with uh, the discussion today. It's a re resolution in regards to the gang limit. Uh, it's Prop 4 set by the state of California in relation to essentially how much in local uh, revenue we can generate. And if we exceed that local revenue, then essentially we're faced with challenges. Um, for example, that's the stuff that the state's dealing with right now. Over the last two years, they've exceeded their GAN limit and they're, well, they exceeded it last year. They're projected to exceed it this year. So they're going to be faced with the situation where they either have to pay the money back to the citizens. Um, for example, last year they, you know, did their Golden State stimulus to the locals, so in a way it helped out because of COVID, but in a way they were gonna need to pay that money back anyway. So um, in our local county, last year's, um, uh, or I guess this year's um, gang limit is set at 46, uh, 46 uh, million. 
Um, our projected uh, revenue that we generate through local is about 25 million, so we're 21 million under. Um, we've been discussing essentially what we collect out of our local um, area. We essentially, based off of what the state tells us, is like I guess the maximum that we can collect. We're essentially collecting at about half. Um, uh, the ways that the, the funding that's incorporated into this, for example, property taxes, sales taxes, um, fees that are generated or um, uh, through franchises or some local fines that are you know given out to the community through whatever, whether it's code enforcement, things like that. But relatively minor, the bigger ones, uh, taxes, uh, property and uh, sales tax. And we're well within the limit of the gang limit, not in comparison to the state and uh, essentially all we're asking for the board is to approve the gang limit for us for fiscal year 22 23 which is set at 46 million um, which would be nice if we were to receive the that funding amount and uh, that's uh, that's it um, Thank, thanks Gabriel I'm gonna pass it back to you for our, um, public comment, public comment? Then, yes please if you'd like to make a comment in chambers please provide a speaker card on Zoom, you can press star nine on your phone or the raise your hand icon on your screen. Maria Spandry. I'm Maria Spandry, um, Vets Park Commissioner again. And um, and so I guess what I wanted to do is, is give you a little bit of a history of our of our park. So in 1957, when this park was granted to us, it was granted on the fact of um, to be able to give it back to the community. And so the way the park was divided up was the four sections, the Babe Ruth, Hollister Heat, which they weren't in existence, but it was for the, for the community. Um, and so that we broke it up. And with, with their leases, the leases were to be where they maintained their field. The relationship with, that I have with the city really is a good one. They maintain the field, two fields, vet large and vet small. They provide not just, um, so Junior Giants has over 600 children, no fees, um, and um, they also have over 30 adult leagues, which those fees go back to maintaining the field. They're just like all of the other groups that maintain the field. We have not done our job as, as a landlord to maintain the structures around that. If they're maintaining the fields for community for the community, if we increase any prices, you're going to see a decline in all of the registration fees because people can't afford it. As it is right now, what is there to do in town? If we can keep the kids busy with sports, scouts, 4-H, this is a service that I'm asking. Um, I know it's a, it's a far ask, but this is something that we should be giving back to the community. When that land was granted, it was for the community. Any other park, you've done lighting to keep it safe. You pay for water to keep the grounds nice. You pay for maintenance to keep it safe. Um, these are all the things that we would do at any other park. We've, all the other groups maintain their areas. And so what we're asking for you guys is, is that we need, it's in the center of town. We need you guys to know that this is, this is something back in 50, 1957. The reason why the board was made up, the commission was made up in the, in the way it is, we have two board of supervisors because they trust you to look for the community. They chose three veterans, one from San Juan Batista, Amer um, the veterans of foreign war. You have American Legion and you have me as a, the Hollister representative. So these things are, they entrusted us to give back to the community. You have three veterans because we are very passionate about community service. We are community servants. If, if anybody, I know there's a few of you that have, I've bent the ear to. I'm a very passionate person when it comes to parks because I just see the need for the kids to have something. And so when you look at all of the things that we are asking for, these are things that shouldn't have been at the point that they're at. We're, we're spending more money now because we haven't done anything. And so just so that you know, this is not something that, um, this is a, just a responsibility as a landlord of what we have not been doing. And so that's why the costs are there. And to keep it safe because it's in the middle of town, 
we have to do our job. And so thank you. I thank appreciate you. your time. Gina, no? Hi, I'm Gina Nadi. Um, I'm with Hollister Heat. Um, the five entities, which are Babe Ruth, um, Little League, Hollister Heat, City Rec, and the uh, Tremors and their so soccer, um, like she said, we, we each take care of our area. Um, the part that we don't take care of is the parking lot. But as far as the lights on the field, it's our responsibility to have those lights, you know, changed. Um, landscaping, um, any equipment equipment, any irrigation, repairs. Um, we don't pay for the water, as it was stated, but any irrigation, any pipes that break um, on our fields, it's our responsibility. Um, part of what is so unique is Little League's fields are immaculate. They put so much time and money and effort into keeping theirs clean. Um, Hollister Heat the same. We somebody said well volunteers do it not you don't get that many volunteers you get a lot of people that need the service that I mean we charge our girls $125 to play um, for a season which isn't a lot and you said um, the question was asked well what do you what do we do with the money well um, we pay for insurance for the girls because it um, there's a broad insurance um, umbrella uniforms we pay for um, sorry, um, all the equipment we pay for. They can bring their own gloves, but we pay for all the balls, all the umpires, um, everything that our organization needs to run. In addition, um, we work with City Rec, with Tina, we work with um, the Tremors, and we work with Little League to keep the parking lot clean. Um, it, it's a beautiful area. If you go up there at sunset, you can pick any spot to watch a game and you will be like the sense it gives you. And I think that's why everybody loves it so much. Who's, you know, my dad coached Little League there. I coached with them Little League when I was little, you know, and you, it's just part of our community. And the part that, that we need the help with and really it is about safety. Um, you have an ice cream truck come in, right? Ice cream trucks are part of an experience at a ballpark. Kids run to the ice cream truck. There's no rhyme or reason to where that ice cream truck can go. The heat, we open our gate and our thing is come in here and park so that there's, take that element out. Because that parking, again, and, and I don't mean to be a dead horse, but if you've been out there, it is crazy. Even if the parking lot is empty, you have people coming in because there is no markings. The markings are gone now. People are, are everywhere. And again, it's just a safety issue. And like I said, there was numerous times we've heard there was 75,000 for lights. It was already approved. We have no lights. And, and I understand the money went back into the general fund, but there's no tracking. Nobody tracked the projects. and. We have a dark, you know, they say, oh, crime, and they say, oh, the skate park. Um, there's, you know, drugs, but there's no lights. If there were lights out there, there would be less crime. The more I'm out there or people are out there, the less people come out that do bad things, you know? So the more we treat it with respect and honor, for our veterans and for our community, the more we do, the more people will do. And, and really, it's a special place. I encourage you all to go out there and catch a game. Get a hot dog from Nathan or whoever and enjoy it because it, it, it's slowly going away, right? Our kids are slowly more on their phones and social media. I'm gonna stop you there, but we hear the safety Ask that you're asking of us, and believe me, we've heard you. Okay, thank we've you. Heard I you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Valerie yeah, Eglund. And, and I might add that it it is in, we've approved. I mean, we're approved. We we've approved the money, so it is going to get spent. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Okay, listening uh, to all the budgetary things, um, uh, I, I've made notations. Uh, number one, the grant writer, the importance of having a grant writer, especially for the bicycle lanes, San Juan, uh, it is so important, uh, school uh, to community, uh, and San Juan community uses that for walking, running, biking. Uh, I see people out there all the time as well as um, workers who uh, are working out at the ag areas, they'll go out by bike. And, and we really want to encourage that. Uh, number two, uh, the county naming policy is something that we've asked for in the last couple of years. Uh, and I believe Mike and uh, Ray were going to work on a policy uh, that we can take like to the business community, the business council, offer uh, naming rights for particular areas that are mapped on the, uh, the regional park uh, plan. So these, this, is, this would be lucrative and it would also uh, encourage business participation in our parks and it would show the community how much uh, what um, encouragement there is for participation in the parks. That makes sense? I don't know. Um, number four, the Cienega to Mudstone bike lane for the, uh, is it, oh, what did you say? I didn't say bike lane, right? Uh, the, the Cienega road out to Mudstone is uh, really, really needed. Uh, recently, there was a meeting out at Mudstone uh, with the state park and uh, a uh, pump track developer uh, from Santa Cruz. Uh, and the state has always had in Mudstone's plan a pump track, uh, in fact, uh, several different levels for younger and older folks. Uh, and when I was at that meeting there, uh, it was brought up as well that when the road from Hollister to, uh, when the Cienega Road is, is improved, that we need a bicycle route alongside that so that kids from Hollister can come out to Mudstone, which it is not a far reach to bike that far. Uh, as well, there is a small pump track being planned within the regional park. So this would give them training area and incentive, let's go to Mudstone next, right? So this kind of thing gives you such a wonderful interactivity between the state parks uh, and uh, the city. So, oh, last thing. Uh, the San Juan Canyon Road, definitely it can be put back. Uh, San Juan Cement Plant, uh, laid all that cement in there long ago anyway, uh, and it's not too bad. Uh, but the uh, Salinas grade road really does need improvement, and the dumping that is up there is atrocious. Uh, we've put it on Facebook, uh, showing the mountain of garbage down the hillside uh, in several different areas. Uh, so some type of an improvement that would stop people from backing up and dumping, dumping in, in, onto these roadsides. And I can't imagine those property owners have not screamed uh, somewhere along the line, probably just into the clear air, knowing it won't be heard. Uh, but if any kind of an improvement can be made to the old stage road, which I don't believe it is, it was repurposed from the, the Y section, from Al, uh, the Alameda. So you've got the Alameda coming down, Old Stage Road, uh, San Juan Grade Road, <coughs> Sam, uh, San Juan Canyon Road, and then Vineyard. So it, it's, a, a, it's a very used intersection, uh, and it is very deteriorated uh, on the uh, Old Stage Road up to the gate. You don't even have to go up to the gate, but there's an area there where you've got a small community, uh, some housing in there, and the Dante Baines property, which the uh, county could lease for better parking for the Anza Trail. 
So anyway, uh, my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just for the record, um, I went ahead and allowed each of the speakers to go over. You've been here all morning with us. You've seen the, the deliberations that we've had to take. And I thank you for your input. And it, it's been very valuable what you provided to us. Um, so thank you. Um, but, but I won't let it happen again. <laughs> OK. On Zoom, if you'd like to make a comment, please press star 9 or there is your hand icon on your screen. No other comments. Thank you. I'm so glad you came up to talk to us, Belinda. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I have one more comment um, on the uh, capital improvements budget. Um, number 13, the Hall of Records, the abatement um, plus the first floor, floor remodel. I have to say that I'm very disappointed that that is again deferred. Um, the abatement part of it is um, a safety issue for the building, and then it's also a technology. It limits what we can do as far as technology because we can't do a lot because of the, the roof and the floor um, until the abatement is done. Um, there are safety issues, so I'm in charge treasurer tax collector we basically handle all the money in the county and i this year i asked for um uh security cameras which i don't see on the list um we work hand in hand with the assessor's office so we basically turn all his work into revenue for the county for the school districts for the special districts and the treasurer manages all the money um, then we also have a space issue on uh, the first floor remodel. Um, the assessor and myself, we've asked for many years uh, for, um, we're having issues with space and we're the majority of the first floor and we wanted to expand into the old justice court system um, office and so that is, that's an issue with our logistics and our, our staff and the, and the space um, problems that we're having. So anyways, I wanted to say that I'm very disappointed that again, the Hall of Records is being overlooked. Well, I, I'm looking at the, the list and if, did you, did you get this list that we have, the spreadsheet? Because I see the Hall of Records as being one of the items that we were addressing they were on the rolling forward. Um. It's rolling forward. Um, what my my record um, says deferred, and it doesn't have any amount in there that we're doing something this year with that. Yeah. Okay. Rolling forward to fiscal year twenty three twenty four. So is is the assessor's portion not included in the phase one? Um, that's on item number thirteen from the legal size document, the spreadsheet. Her ask is not included in that? The abatement or? Yes, the hollow records abatement phase one, the elections, is it just specifically the elections and not the assessor's office? Uh, I was going to say that would be a better question for RMA and capital projects, but. Could we get clarification? When I think of Hall of Records, I just think of the old courthouse in general, I, I, not the specific offices. It's different. Yeah, I, I believe we're discussing the same project, but um, she's correct. It was deferred till 23-24, fiscal year 23-24. So, um, On the other sheet year. then. Yes, please. Okay, so um, when I first was appointed about seven months ago, one of the stops that Ray took me to was um, over to the assessor and collector's office and so I recently saw firsthand uh, the situation that you're in um, and so I do have to say it, it is um, kind of alarming um, if you go over there and take a look and there's just piles and piles boxes and boxes I guess I should say of paperwork and then also to just kind of if, if there's an abatement issue as well, I don't know. But in any case, I feel like maybe two years is too long to address it. Madam Chair? Yes, please. Can we use ARPA money on this? 
there is a mechanism in play. I would, well, I could bring it up to the ad hoc committee and discuss it further, but there is a mechanism in play that can be you know, utilized for not just this project, but <coughs> a whole cohort of projects. And we could definitely bring it up. Um, I guess maybe a larger discussion for that would be, do we just stop at that kind of abatement or do we consider the total project like at large to do the complete piece of it maybe include some of the items by the assessor's office and the treasurer tax collector that may maybe some extra work remodel while we're in there that we may want to consider what we can do is we can what we'll do is we'll agendas agendize this for the um for the ad hoc um we'll come back and this item we'll have as a regular session item in our um, budget so that we can discuss it with the entire board with the uh, with can, the recommendation from can the Can we do that both for the facilities as well as um, the ARPA? So that way it's, it, we're looking at, yeah. at, bo yeah, at both, both in, in yeah. both aspects? Yeah. Okay. Can do that. This has been deferred before? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's it, not just this year. It's been deferred no, for a while. No, been, it's been a while. I yeah. think even when I came on board yeah. before it was on the budget. I think we did move the boxes, though. But <laughs> <laughs> but we still need to address that. We've been dis at the, actually the last facility meeting, we talked about buying yeah. Connex boxes and, and taking, you know, getting all of our outside storage and bringing them in-house as well. Uh, just because we're busting at the seams and that's an issue as well. So we can okay. we'll bring that back. We can bring all that right. back. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Thank you. Okay. So then is that the extent of what we need to, okay, so then I will entertain a motion to adjourn then. <laughs> so moved, yeah, Madam Chair. I'll second. Okay, all in favor indicate by saying aye. Oh, aye. What? Oh, whoops. <laughs> Did we not go to public comment? The resolution. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, we so yeah. we're not gonna adjourn quite yet. <laughs> So can I get a motion on the resolution for the GAN limit? I'll, I'll so move. Okay. Second. Okay, we have a second. All in favor of um, the adoption of the resolution, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? And, uh, four zero on that. And I want to thank staff, thank all the department heads and everyone uh, yes. for all the input, all thank the work you all that's, for your that feedback. we've done. I mean, it's been a lot of work. Appreciate everything that's been done. Thank you, Gabriel. And. Um, Hopefully, um, you know, obviously there's going to be uh, some tweaking, but in June uh, 27th, tweaking, we'll a, yes. we, we will have a pretty good budget, pretty solid budget. So Creative thank you, financing. thank you, board, as well, for your input. Appreciate <laughs> it. Great job, everyone. All right. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, everyone. So I'll now take the motion to adjourn then. Oh. We kind of did, but we didn't vote on it. Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Mo <laughs> meeting adjourned. <laughs> <Are we really> adjourned? <laughs>